שם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, first and foremost, it's a lag ba'omer, חג lag ba'omer שמח to everybody, it's a, ברוך השם, one of the favorite holidays for עם ישראל, is lag ba'omer, number one, it doesn't obligate you to do that much, but more importantly, it's a celebratory holiday, where you have a bonfire in Eretz Yisrael for the most part, Every, uh, every neighborhood has a few bonfires. You go on the internet, you see that uh, so many different communities have huge bonfires. In America, we're not really allowed to do it. So uh, usually you have, uh, sometimes you'll have shuls have a little bonfire that uh, they have to get a city permit to get a month in advance. And they have to get uh, you know, the fire department to park their car and it probably costs more money to have a bonfire in America than to uh, build a building. It's just a, uh, because of all the permits. But uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the bonfires is that for the most part, most Jewish people don't even know why we have it. Most people don't know why we have it. I mean, it's a, uh, there's a lot of happy days for Judaism. But we don't have a bonfire on Purim. We don't have a bonfire on Shavuot. We don't have a bonfire for Pesach. We don't have a bonfire for any other holiday. But we have a bonfire for the Ilula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Ilula of uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, we don't have a bonfire. The Ilula of uh, Rabbi Mir Balanes, which was also a few days ago, no bonfire. Rabbi Akiva, the rabbi of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, no bonfire. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we have a bonfire. So it's a very interesting question, which Bezat Hashem will answer today. Also, uh, a little bit of update before we start with the questions. Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of you. I'm glad that uh, many more of you are uh, coming because it shows us that Kadosh Baruch Hu is happy with this amazing Torah Challenge program that we started. B'shut, our dear youth director, uh, Michal. Ashrech uh, v'ashrech elkech. The Bezat Hashem, this is a, uh, going to help the entire community do tshuva. Now, I just came back from New York a few hours ago. We had, Baruch Hashem, a lot of success over there. We did a couple of lectures in uh, Queens, in Manhattan. And, uh, Baruch Hashem, people are looking for the truth. People are looking for something a little bit different than the usual. And most people are tired of li being lied to. Uh, that uh, everyone knows that everything is not okay. But uh, we like to pretend like it is. So when someone tells you that it's not a, why it's not okay, even though it requires you to change a few things to make it okay, it's a breath of fresh air. So that's hopefully what we're going to try to do again, Bezat Hashem, today, to give you guys a little bit of breath of fresh air from the Torah Kedusha, give you a little bit of insights of what Da'at Torah actually says, what it says, and I promise you, if you've never been in any of my shiurim, most likely you haven't heard any of this stuff. Even though everything that we teach, everything from Aleph Atav, is basic level Judaism. We do not teach any secrets. We do not teach anything overly mystical. We do not teach anything that only belongs to the Kabbalistic world. We don't even teach anything that belongs to advanced learners. We teach what you are supposed to learn in Kita Aleph. First grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. We teach basic level Judaism. The problem is that today, because we, we live in a politically correct world where everyone tries to be nice uh, and uh, doesn't want to offend people, we got to a point where many people are afraid to tell you guys the truth and uh, they pretend to tell you the truth by saying very nice things that agrees with your life and causes you to stay exactly the same without ever thinking that you need to change and do tshuva. Now I could uh, tell all of you, regardless of whether you're wearing a big hat and you're one of my students for a couple of years or you're wearing a small keeper that you just put on just for the Kvoda Makom and you put it on, you're going to take it off when you leave. Regardless, all of you have to do tshuva. And I'm one of them. I also have to do tshuva. All of us have to do tshuva. If you don't think that you have to do tshuva, that's alone another reason why you have to do tshuva. Somebody came to the Ramban, Nechmanides, almost 900 years ago. He said, Kvod Arab, how come I have to say vidui? How come I have to say vidui? Every day, you know, the uh, Sfaradim say it uh, th you know, twice a day, the Ashkenazim, depends where you live in the world. If it's in Israel, also twice a day. If it's in America, sometimes nothing. It depends because the different minagim. But Vidui says, is Chatanu Avinu Pashanu. I'm sorry, Hashem, I did this sin, I did that sin, I did this sin. So the guy comes to the Ramban, he says, Well, I didn't do all this stuff. 
I didn't lie. I didn't cheat. I didn't murder. I didn't do this. I didn't do this. I didn't do all the stuff that it says. Why am I saying I'm sorry for it? So Ramban asks, tells him, he says, you see, you think you didn't do it. You think you didn't do all this stuff, but that only means that you don't understand what you're saying. You read the language, you read the words, but you actually don't understand what you're saying. If you understood what these words mean, you'd realize not only are you guilty of every single one of them, but you have to do tshuva for the stupidity of thinking you don't have to do tshuva. Most of us don't think we have to change. And the reason why is because our life is okay for the most part. Most of us have a few shekels in our pocket. We have a roof over our head. We have food to eat, sometimes for free, sometimes we have to pay for it, but either way we have it. No one's starving, no one's going to sleep hungry. Am Yisrael is very rich. We're the richest we've ever been other than the time of Shlomo HaMelech. But that's also part of the problem. So what we try to do is we have to remind ourselves of what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu say when he gives us blessings and instead of us getting closer to him we stop, sometimes get further from him because we think that everything is okay. So my goal today is Be'ezlat Hashem to do the same thing I did in New York, the same thing we've been doing here for the last four or five years, which is to try to answer any and every question that you guys have, that for the purpose of giving you a little chizuk, for the purpose of give, giving you a little bit of strength to overcome your Yetzirah, to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to do more mitzvot willingly. Not because you have to, not because it's going to make your mommy and daddy happy, not because you think it's going to make any difference in my life or anybody else's life. The whole goal is for you to understand that you need it. You need to do tshuva. I need to do tshuva. Everybody needs to do it, but you need to do it for yourself. Not to impress your friends, or hopefully to find a shiduch, or maybe because if you do tshuva, you're going to get a million dollars. Not for that reason. You have to do tshuva simply because you have to realize that you have an obligation to your creator. Everyone has to realize they have an obligation to their creator. If you believe that there is a creator, you believe that there's a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and that a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives you everything and anything that you have, the least you can do is comply with what he's asking you to do. Now he says, next week's parasha, Im if you go with my laws, he gives you all types of blessings. Even war you won't have to worry about. Your enemies are going to run from you. One of you can beat a thousand of them. But he says, Im, im Lo telechu. If you didn't go with my laws, in bechukotai lo telechu. Then he gives us four, over forty different verses, giving us details of exactly what happened during the Holocaust, without missing a beat. All types of horrible, disastrous things. Now, who wants such a problem? So it's much easier to just comply and just do the laws. Problem is that most of us don't know the laws. Most of us don't even know that we're obligated to fulfill the laws, and that's my goal. My goal is to, first and foremost, if anyone has a suffix, has a doubt whether God exists, ask those kind of questions. We have to get out of here today knowing for sure that there's a God. Not believing, knowing. Knowing for sure that HaKadosh Baruch Hu exists. Second thing is, we have to come out of here knowing for sure that the Torah is the only document in the world that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to the world. There's no other document. There's nothing else. Torah Kedoshah. There's the written Torah, there's the oral Torah. Ask questions like that. Number three, make sure you ask questions about specific things that you perhaps have a problem with, things that you're struggling with, that perhaps maybe you don't think you have to do, or maybe you think you should do, but you're not really sure you have to, whether it's business, or it's personal, or it's uh, embarrassing, or it's not embarrassing. Don't be embarrassed. Trust me when I tell you I've heard it all by now. I've heard all types of wonderful questions, all types of problems, all types of issues. We try to help every single one. Now, the last but not least thing, Baruch Hashem, we got a few copies of uh, Rabbi Ephraim's, uh, our rabbi's uh, new book, Bar Yochai, it's uh, the Piyut. Bar Yochai, this is uh, one of the most famous songs that Am Yisrael has today, that uh, most families that uh, have Kiddush, that sing songs after Kiddush, sing the song Bar Yochai, but most people, like I said, don't actually know, you know what, it actually, what they're actually saying. So Rabbi Faim Sheikhyeh put a fantastic book together, giving detailed commentary on the book. Now it's in Hebrew only, and it's in high-level Hebrew, so I only recommend it for people that are already very well learned in the Torah, and not just someone that knows how to pronounce words, not to, you know, not to insult anyone, it's just not going to be useful for you. It's not going to be useful for you to 
just look at the words because you like the way they look. Uh, I gave it to a couple of people that are uh, Israelis in their 50s and 60s. They looked at it and they didn't know what they were looking at. So it's not even a matter of whether you know Hebrew. It's actually whether you know Torah. You know Sfat HaKodesh. So it's a very high level. But Baruch Hashem, this came out, which also means that Be'ezrat Hashem, we're going to uh, work on it over these uh, this next several months. And Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, by... Uh, this next year, we'll have it translated to English. We'll have it translated to English, so that's going to help anybody that wants to read it in the English language. Uh, without further ado, please ask any question you want. And uh, as you all know, the uh, objective is to ask questions that mean something to you. It doesn't necessarily have to mean something to everybody else, but it has to mean something to you. Uh, and uh, if you ask a question that I don't have an answer for, it doesn't mean there isn't an answer. Don't get worried. Don't think that uh, the Torah doesn't have an answer. It just means I don't have the answer. And as a, uh, as a I'm sorry gesture to you, I'll give you 50 bucks. So I'm sorry that I don't know enough. But if HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives me the insight and I know all your questions, then Bezat Hashem, then uh, you come back next week and you try to figure out another way to ask another question that maybe I don't know. So Bezat Hashem, Nasev and Asliach, who wants to start? Usually when the camera is off, everybody has a question. Camera is on, everybody, nobody has a question. Everybody's mute. Last week, we were here on uh, Sunday. Sunday, we were here uh, late. Uh, last week, we were here till I think, what, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning? Asking questions. The second shoe outside was longer than the first shoe. Okay, since none of you have questions, I'll start off with a question. Why do we actually light a fire on Lagva Omer? Anybody have an idea? Why fire? Why can't we uh, have a barbecue? Why we have barbecues, but we don't. No, you know that, that's not the chad. Why do we light a fire? Why do we light a bonfire? The kids in Israel collect wood for a couple of weeks. All over Yerushalayim, all over Netanya, they collect little pieces of wood from garbage pails, from the uh, woods to collect it, to collect it, to collect it, to burn the whole thing in one day. That's I remember when I was a kid, we used to love it. Whole night the, the light, fire is lighting. We put some potatoes on there. It's a lot of fun. Unfortunately, we don't have that uh, in America, but nonetheless, most of you, I'm assuming, realize that there is a fire connected to this Chag. Question is why? No, who wants to volunteer and answer? You had your, your hand raised. Go ahead. Well, I believe it's because of the, that fire that the Kabbalah gives you and that he created the Kabbalah, so on his David's birthday, he led a fire in representing his efforts and all his, and all his work. And we use fire specifically because it's a tool of Hashem, and Hashem gave him that kind of like it symbolizes that Hashem gave him the effort. That's my opinion. Nice answer. It's not the right. It's not the answer, but it's a nice answer. No, it's Tom. It's not like it's not the answer. It's not true, but it could be. Could be. Could be a dot. No, who else wants the bond? But usually you have some answers. No, go ahead. I have a question. I have a question. Oh, a question. Yeah, question. question. Okay. How big does the words have to be in a mezuzah? How big does the words have to be in a mezuzah? Yeah. It can be different sizes. There's no specific size. There are big mezuzot, there are small mezuzot. I mean, there is a, uh, there's a minhag to have a standard size uh, mezuzah. Most mezuzot have the same size, but there is actually the mekubalim. For example, the mekubalim write in very big letters. Like if you come to my house one day, you're going to see in my house, in the front door, there's a very big mezuzah. Usually they have it on big bateknes or big buildings. But this mezuzah, this mezuzah, this mezuzah I got from a very, very uh, learned cover list, that even if you gave me a half a million dollars, I wouldn't give it to you. That's the kind of mezuzah. But this mezuzah is about twice the size of your normal mezuzah. I'm talking about the parchment, the paper. That's what exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the casing. I'm not talking about the piece of plastic. I'm talking about the parchment, yes. It a nice, it's a nice, it's uh, a nice, nice thing, but it's a uh, the mezuzah. There's different, uh, there's different opinions, and there is a, in a uh, common opinion that it can be uh, large size. Like for example, my uh, my mezuzah is uh, like I said, double the size of a normal. If you go to uh, the Kotel Amaravi, you go to Kotel Amaravi, the mezuzah is the size of a little bit bigger than your arm, over there. And it's not just the casing. The mezuzah itself is big. The mezuzah itself is big. Not, 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 they don't care about the casing doesn't mean anything. The casing doesn't mean anything. In the old days, there wasn't casing. In the old days, they would just put the mezuzah itself. But uh, because it would uh, get damaged, then they started putting casing later on. 
But uh, back to our question of why do we light fire on Lag Baumel? Okay, so does anybody know the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai going into the uh, cave? Everybody heard the story? Yes, no, you're with me, you're with your phones, you're with the hot dogs. You guys asking? I know this stuff, so I, I don't have to ask the questions. I'm asking you so you can learn. Okay, so here's the story. Ma'ala Sechet Shabbat, page 33b. If you're already going to come, you might as well learn. If you want to chit-chat and hang out, you can go outside. Um, this is not school. You don't have to be here. As then, we're trying to get you guys to learn so it helps you. And Bezal Hashem helps all of us. But if you're going to chit-chat and you're going to hang out, you're not going to really be interested in for what? Gemara Masechet Shabbat says that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was sitting and talking to a couple of other Tanaim, a couple of the other Gdolei Adom. And they had a conversation. Now, of course, Chachamim always talk about the Torah. They don't talk about the mundane. They don't talk about, you know, what do you think of sports? What do you think of this uh, LeBron James's new contract? What do you think of the stock market? That's not the conversation they have. They have things that they connect to the Torah Kedusha. But this conversation was slightly different because one of the Chachamim says that uh, Rabbi Uda says that uh, look at all of the buildings that the Romans built. Look at all these buildings they built, the bathhouses they built, the uh, toll road they built. Wow, this is uh, amazing that they did it. Me, This is the will of Hashem. This is the will of Hashem. If Hashem let them build it, this is the will of Hashem, right? Rabbi Yossi didn't say anything, but Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai went the exact opposite direction. He said, no, no, absolutely not. These Romans are reshaim. These Romans are wicked. These Romans are idol worshippers. And the only reason why they built what they built is not to help the people, but rather to help themselves. They built the bridges in order to collect more tolls. They built the markets in order to fool more people, in order to sell them more stuff they don't need. They built the bathhouses in order to promote more promiscuity and prostitution. They built it for their own needs. They didn't build it for, for the people. So now, at that time, there was a uh, young man that was sitting next to them, a uh, convert, was sitting next to them that didn't know right, right or left. But uh, he overheard the conversation. He was excited about listening to a conversation of three of the biggest rabbis in the world. And he started telling, you know, he told some of his family members and his friends, not realizing that this is not a conversation you spread to other people because you're talking about the Malchut, talking about the government. So now, after he told one person, one person told two people, two people went three people, next thing you know, he got to the government. The Caesar heard this, he said, what? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said that we did this for ourselves, he's talking against us, put a bounty on his head, death penalty. Death penalty, kill him. Whoever catches him first, death penalty, you get a reward for it. This also teaches us, by the way, as a side note, if you ever want something to be a secret, don't tell anyone. Literally, anyone. If, as soon as you tell your secret to one person, it is no longer a secret, and it's only a matter of time before the exact person that you don't want knowing the secret will find out. So now Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai heard that there's a gzerah, there's a decree on his head and on his son, so they ran away and they went to hide in a cave. Now Hashem obviously protects the tzaddikim, so he made a, a few miracles happen. As soon as they got to the cave, they didn't have uh, enough time to pack bags and, and bring stuff with them. They just ran away. So they didn't have any food, they didn't have any clothes, they didn't have anything. They just got there. Now, what are we going to do for food? Hashem miraculously makes a tree, a carob tree, grow out of the ground. Completely with the fruits. Now, anyone that knows about carob trees, Gemara says it takes 70 years. 70 years for a carob tree to actually get to a point of bearing its fruit. This happened in one second. Just like in Maasei Bereshit, just like in the beginning of the world. Second thing is for water, Hashem created a river out of thin air, out of nothing, just a river came right next to the cave. So it allows Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Hassan to hide and learn to lie in peace. And over there, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai learned an immense amount of Torah and they gave a lot of kavod for the Torah to an extent that they knew that if they're going to be in this cave for a while, their clothes are going to get ruined. And since they don't have a second outfit, what they did is they buried, they made a big hole in the ground. They took off their clothes, went inside the hole, covered themselves in sand and that way that they're covered, their privates are covered, their body is covered and that way they can learn Torah all day. 
but without ruining their clothes. And anytime they had to pray, or it was Shabbat, they would come out of the hole and put their clothes on. That way the clothes would actually be long-lasting. Now, this obviously wasn't exactly the healthiest thing to do to their bodies, and later on when they came out of the cave, they had a lot of scars and uh, bruises and damage and things of that nature, but the point being is that they knew how important it is to not only learn Torah, but also get kavod for the Torah. That's why I always tell people that if you're ever going to go to a shiur Torah, don't bother to go to the shiur Torah if you're going to play with your phone. Why? Because even if you listen to the shiur Torah, but you're actually desecrating the Torah by playing with your phone, you're making a sin at the same time that you're making a mitzvah, meaning they both go in the garbage. So you're wasting your time. So the key is that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai knew, and he's teaching us that kavod for the Torah is even more important than the actual learning of Torah. And the reason why is because if you learn Torah without having kavod, without having honor for the Torah, your Torah is considered something we're not allowed to learn. We're not allowed to learn. Why? It's a Torah that's not from Shemaim. But if your Torah has kavod, then the Kadosh Baruch Hu will give you a healthy and beautiful Torah. That's why the Gemara Masechet Moed Katan says that someone that's arrogant, he's not allowed to teach Torah. But if he teaches Torah, you're not allowed to listen to him. Why? Because this Torah cannot be from Shemaim. He's using his own logic. Because if he learned real Torah, he cannot be arrogant at the same time. The point being is that now after, after 12 years, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, Rabbi Lazar, came out of the cave. Day and night they've been learning Torah. They got to a completely different level. They were learning Torah with angels. They were learning different secrets of the Torah that are unbelievable. Things that literally happen in heaven. When they came out, they were on such a high level when they saw people, regular religious Jews. It wasn't like today that you have to look for religious Jews. There, everybody was religious. Once in a while you saw someone that was less religious. But they saw people, religious people, religious Jews, going to work. Like a regular person is supposed to do. You know, you're going to learn, you're going to work, you're going to learn, you're going to work. You can't just learn, you can't just work. You have to do both for most people. For Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, this was unacceptable. As soon as he saw religious Jews going to work, he said, how could these people, how could these people waste even a moment that they're supposed to learn Torah chasing money? And because of his dusha, those people went on fire. They went on fire. So a bat call, a heavenly voice came from Shemaim and said to Rabbi Shimon, hey, what are you trying to ruin my world? They're not on your level. You are different. Go back into the cave. Hashem commanded him and his son, to go back into the cave. And they had to go back into the cave and Hashem actually lowered their Kedusha by a little bit in order for them to be able to deal with the world. So what do we learn from here? We learn that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, his Kedusha is fire, just like he was saying. But that's the reason why we actually light a fire on Lag Baomer representation to us and a reminder for us that if we don't learn Torah, if we don't learn Torah and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was next to us, he'd light us on fire. That's why we light a fire. Meaning that if you're not learning Torah, and I'll answer your question in a second, if you're not learning Torah, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai is screaming at you from Shammai and says, for what, what are you here for? Why are you in this world if you don't learn Torah? Okay, you want to work? Work. No problem working. But when are you going to learn? Oh, I'll learn, you know, maybe once or twice a month. Once or twice a month. For, how are you going to fulfill the Torah learning once or twice a month? Okay, I'll learn once or twice a week. How are you going to fulfill your role in the world learning once or twice a week? Can you live eating only once or twice a week? No. Just like you have to eat every day. You have to learn Torah every day. Every person, different amounts. Like I said, when I first started doing tshuva, learning 5, 6, 10, 15 hours a day was impossible for me. So I started with 15 minutes a day. That's how I started. I made a rule for myself. Every day I'm going to learn 15 minutes. No matter what. Doesn't matter how busy I was, how big the contracts I was signing were, how many medical problems I had. It didn't make a difference. 15 minutes a day, commitment, that's what I'm going to do. Little by little, 15 minutes got to 20 minutes, then 25 minutes, and 30 minutes, and so on and so forth. But the point is, is that every single Jew has to make a team la Torah. You have to make time to learn Torah, and the reason why... It's not just because of Lag Baomer. The opposite. It's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that if you don't learn Torah every day, you cannot be resurrected with the dead. The Mashiach comes, he won't look at you in a very good way. Gan Eden, Genom, 
If you don't learn Torah, there's nothing for you to do in Gan Eden. You have to learn Torah every day. Every day. You can learn Shurim, watch it on YouTube. You can come to the Shur. You can learn from a book. Baruch Hashem, in this generation, we have many, many ways to learn Torah. But the point being is, we have to make ourselves some time for Torah every day. Chabot, question. In regards to when they went back in the cave, I heard that there's a shot in uh, when they came out of the cave after the second time, after everything was burning around them, I heard that there was like a goat, they met a hunter around them, right? And there was a goat, like a bird in the sky. Okay. And there was like a specific me hidden message that was sent to them. I can't recall it, so I'm asking you if you could, do you know exactly what that was about? A message from the dove? Yeah, like it wasn't necessarily specific to. Well, the yeah, I think I think I believe no. That's before they came out. Yes, where they, uh, what what happened is they yeah. saw the hunter. They yeah. saw the hunter outside of the cave, and uh, they saw that the hunter is able to uh, get parnasa. So he says, if Hakadosh Baruch Hu is worrying for parnasa for this person, if Hakadosh Baruch Hu is protecting the life of this person, needless to say, he's going to protect us. He's going to protect our parnasa. He's going to protect our life. So obviously it's time for us to leave. We don't have to be worried about the Caesar killing us. So as soon as they realized that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives special protection to Tzadikim, Eliyahu Navi showed up and said, Ah, you got the point. Now it's time for you to leave. Now it's time for you guys to exit. Now it's time for you to go. But that was the first time they exited. The second time was just actually a, a semi-punishment. Semi-punishment to the Tzadikim where they say you're overly holy. Where do we learn from that? We learn that someone that's a gadol, someone that's big, someone that's significant, understands his own limitations. But someone that's even bigger than a gadol, someone that's a gadol among gadolim, even bigger, has to understand the limitations of the people. Not just his own, but everybody else. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, go, you're a gadol now. But you only understand your own limitations. And you can't stand these other people because they're not in your level. You have to go back to become even bigger. How? By understanding that they have limitations. They cannot learn Torah 24 hours a day like you. So that's why there's a Gemara in Masechet Brachot that has a debate between Rabbi Shemur Bar Yochai and Rabbi Ishmael whether you're supposed to learn Torah 24 hours a day or not. Rabbi Ishmael says, no, you're supposed to learn and work. Rabbi Shemur Bar Yochai says, no, you're supposed to learn only. So what's the, the conclusion of the debate? Conclusion of the debate is if you can learn all the times, that's what you should do. If you can't because you don't have bitachon, you don't have confidence in Hashem is going to give you parnasah, or you simply don't have the capability to do it, then you should do a balance of work and uh, and uh, learn. And the Rambam writes that how much should you learn versus how much you should work. As much as you work is how much you should learn. You work eight hours a day, you should learn eight hours a day. Alavai Alenu to learn, you know, for most people to learn uh, an hour a day. But the point is that's technically what we're supposed to do. Next question. Yes, how would if every generation we're getting further and further away from like Moshe and God, okay. how are we supposed to bring Mashiach? It doesn't depend on our high level of Kedusha. In fact, the Yor Chaim HaKadosh says that Am Yisrael, before they, uh, before they got to Mount Sinai, they were at the 49th level of Tumah, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to take them out of Egypt at that moment. And the reason why is because if they would have made one more sin, one more sin, they would have reached the 50th level of Tumah, the 50th level of impurity, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu would have had to destroy the world, just like Noah. So he took them out right away to save them. He says, and then at that point, they got up to the 49th level of Kedusha, they got the Torah, and so on and so forth. But the Torah Chaim Kedosh says that before Mashiach comes, Am Yisrael will get to the 50th level, meaning they'll be worse than Mitzrayim, the 50th level of Tumah. So Chachamim asked, wait, how could this be? We thought that if we get to level 50, we get to level 50, then uh, Hashem has to destroy the world. So how are we going to get to the 50th level and Hashem is not going to destroy the world? In fact, we have to get to the 50th level before Mashiach comes. How? He says, before, when we got to the 49th level, before Matan Torah, we didn't have a Torah. So the reason we couldn't get to the 50th level is because there was no recovery for us. The Torah wasn't going to be able to help us. But now that we have already the Torah for 3, 000, uh, 300 years, we can go to the 50th level because we have the Torah that's going to help us recover. So that means that it's not necessarily uh, dependent on, the, on uh, how many people are going to be like Moshe Rabbeinu. There's not going to be a Moshe Rabbeinu in this generation. It's just that how many people are going to be tzaddikim, how many people are going to be reshaim. And the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin says that in a, uh, the Mashiach is not going to come unless certain conditions are met. There's different types of conditions. One of those conditions it says, Dor shekulo zakai, dor shekulo chayav. 
a generation that's, it's either he's going to come in a generation that everybody's righteous or everybody's wicked. So Chamim say, wait, how could this be? It's never going to be a full generation that everybody's righteous. Never. It's never going to happen. There's always going to be a Haman and a Korach and uh, some uh, Hitler somewhere. It has to be. It has to be. Even if he's a Jew, it could be a, it could be a Hitler. On the other hand, there's never going to be a generation that everybody's wicked. There's always going to be a few tzaddikim. Why? Because the Torah says you have to have 36 tzaddikim in order for the world to maintain itself. So what does the Duma actually mean? It says that what is the requirement for Mashiach to come, which answers your question directly. Dor shekulo zakai means not that everybody is righteous, but rather a generation where everyone has picked a direction. Either you're righteous or you're wicked. Nobody in the middle anymore. Like today, most people are somewhere close to the middle. Sometimes worse, sometimes better, but for the most part, everybody's in the middle. Before Mashiach comes, everyone is going to get their test or tests to make a choice. I'm either going all the way, ultra, 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 ultra Orthodox Hashem, or I'm going to be an idol worshiper. One or the other. No more halfway. No more, I'm a religious guy that plays basketball on Shabbat. No more, I'm a religious guy, but I like to go to the movies. No more, I'm a religious guy, but I have a girlfriend. No more of that stuff. Either you're 100% with Hashem, or you're 100% with the Satan. One or the other. No more, I'm a religious guy, but I cheat in my business. No such thing. No such thing. You have to make a choice, and that's what has to happen. We don't have to have Moshe Rabbeinu or Aaron Kohen. We have to have people that make a choice. And from my experience over these last several years of seeing people, I'm seeing it clearly, just like I'm seeing all of you guys in front of me, that everybody's getting a chance. Everybody's getting a chance, which to anybody that's a little bit of a chacham, a little bit wise that sees that's been around for a while, will know everyone is getting their last chance. The train is coming. Last train is coming. You're either going to get on it or you're going to miss it. You're going to wait. You're going to waste time. You're going to joke around for a while. You're going to lay down, you know, you know, just be lethargic about it. You're going to miss the train, but it's the last train. Or you're going to take, get on the train, take advantage of Mizzot Hashem. You will see Mashiach and you'll celebrate. Chavod in the back. You ask the question. Next one. One next. You ask the question. You ask the question. Yes, yes, yes. Why well, try to get everybody to ask a question first? Huh? Why are you not allowed to ask on Why are you allowed to what? Why are you not allowed to ask on Shabbat? Oh, now, the, uh, if you look at the Torah... There is, there's a law called muktzeh. Muktzeh is a uh, is something where it's pretty much supposed to be, literally mean that this is something that's set aside. This is something that belongs to the mundane, the regular week. So you set it aside, and you know that this is not something. Get up! Don't don't lay down. It's not your it's not your bedroom. Uh, it's not something. It's not something that belongs on Shabbat. It's not something that you're going to use on Shabbat. Everybody knows that you're not going to use a barbecue on Shabbat. Why? Because you don't barbecue on Shabbat. It's allowed. It's not allowed. Everyone knows you're not allowed to make a phone call on Shabbat or use your Facebook account on Shabbat. Why? Because you're, uh, you're not allowed to touch electricity. So because you're not allowed to touch the barbecue, you're not allowed to touch the phone, therefore those items become muktze. Now, now, a ball, a ball does not belong in on Shabbat for adults. Children are allowed to play with balls. Children are allowed, you know, little kids that are not at the educational age, five, six, seven, eight, nine, they're allowed to play with a ball. If they have a father or mother that wants to play with them, the father and mother are allowed to play with them because they're playing with them with that ball. But an adult, someone that's already for a male over 13 years old, or a, or a woman that's 12 years old, once they become to become a man or a woman, or according to Judaism, they're not supposed to play with balls on Shabbat. Why? Because they're adults. They're supposed to learn Torah on Shabbat. They're supposed to honor Shabbat, onik Shabbat. Playing basketball on Shabbat is not Kvoda Torah. It's not honor for the Shabbat. So a lot of times when you see so-called religious communities that have a synagogue with a basketball court on it, and then on, and the rabbi is playing basketball uh, on the on the court on Shabbat, you should just pretty much assume that this rabbi either never went to rabbinical school or he's a little bit reformed. He's a little bit Christianized. But according to according to Alakha, adults are not supposed to be allowed to play basketball on Shabbat. Why? It's Divrei Chol. It's something that number one violates the Onik Shabbat, and number two, it does not belong in a adult lifestyle on Shabbat. You want to do it on on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday for exercise and things of that nature. Enjoy yourself. 
But to do it on Shabbat is not allowed because it leads to the violation number three, which is when you play basketball, naturally you're going to sweat profusely. You're going to sweat profusely. How are you going to go to shul sweating profusely? You're going to smell up the place. No one's going to want to be next to you. So what happens? So a lot of the guys that go play Shabbat, go play Shabbat what do they do? They take a shower. Guess what? You know how to take a shower on Shabbat. Oh, so you're going to say, well, I'm going to use the leniency to take a cold shower. That leniency is for sick people. It's not for you to do lechatrila. It's not for you to do, you know, I'm going to just plan on taking a really cold shower every Shabbat. You're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be exceptional cases. The problem is with modern Orthodox mentality is everything became an exception. There's so much exceptions, we forgot what the actual halacha is. So that's why if you want to honor Shabbat, spend your time learning on Shabbat, spend your time resting on Shabbat, spend your time with family on Shabbat, but not playing basketball on Shabbat. How about in the back? Okay. Do we have free choice? Yes, we do. But our ability, and no, I'll give you obviously more color. Uh, more color meaning more, more details. We answered a little bit of this question last week, but free choice definitely exists, but it's not like what we think. Most people think free choice is you could just do whatever you want. That's not what we have. What we have is choice, but it's not free. Meaning, we have our Torah, the Rambam writes, in Shmona Prakim at the end, the 13 principles of faith. 13 principles of faith are the foundation of Judaism. This is the ideology of Judaism. If you follow all 13, you believe all 13, you are a kosher Jew. You violate a single one of them, you are no longer considered a kosher Jew. You are in the class, Chas Shalom, of being a heretic. We cannot count such a person in Minyan. To that extent, one of those, one of those principles is that schar ve'onish, reward and punishment. So that already tells us that our choice is not free. If we do good, according to what Hashem said, we get schal, we get reward. If we do bad, we get onish. So yes, technically, you can do whatever you want, but there's a consequence. Free choice means you can do whatever you want. What is it like? It's like, for example, if you work for someone, and he says, listen, if you come to the office, I'll pay you $1,000. If you don't come to the office, I won't pay you $1,000. That's free choice, meaning there's no consequences. You either get paid or you don't get paid. What we have in reality is this. He tells you, you come to the work, I'll pay you $1,000. You don't come to work, I'm going to send the entire staff, all 30,000 people, and each one of them is going to get a jab at your face until you have no more face. That's what we have. Reward and punishment. If you do good, you get rewarded. You don't do good, you get punished. When do you get punished? At some point, you get punished in this life, but most importantly, you have to know that there, this life is only a corridor. The real punishment and real reward is after this world. And the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 17a, says that there are certain people that are wicked, but their punishment is for 12 months. But there are certain people that are so wicked, according to Hashem's definition of wicked, that their punishment will never end. Meaning, that they will go to a place called Gehenom and will never ever leave it. There's seven levels in Gehenom. First six levels have a certain time frame. One year, two years, five years, a thousand years. But the seventh level is a place that whoever enters never leaves. And there are a certain type of sinners that enter that place. If you want to know what, I can tell you. But I'll answer the next question. Go ahead. You are talking about the 49 levels of Tuma and the 49 levels of Kedusha. Okay. I'm wondering if the owner, Omer has anything to do with that. Yes, it does. Chazaku Baruch. So now, why do we count in Shavuot? Shavuot is a uh, holiday that's a little bit peculiar. Because technically, what is Shavuot supposed to represent? Shavuot is supposed to represent that at the end of Shavuot, we got the Torah. From Pesach until Shavuot is seven weeks plus one day. So at the end, from the time we left Egypt until the time of Shavuot, technically we got the Torah. We actually got the Torah on the 51st day. So Shavuot is the seven weeks in between. But technically we should call this holiday the holiday of Matan Torah. The holiday that we receive the Torah. But we don't call it that. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that in order for Am Yisrael to receive the Torah, they had to do two things. One, get rid of the Tumah, get rid of the sins, stop sinning, stop, stop being idol worshippers, whether the idolatry was idol worship of money 
or idol worship of statues, or idol worship of sex, or idol worship of anything that separates them from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Anytime you are obsessed and fanatical about anything other than Hashem, it could be idol worship. And most of the time it is. It doesn't, idol worship is not just statues. Idol worship can literally even be money. Eloi HaKesef, Eloi HaZav. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, first and foremost, stop sinning, the big sins. Second of all, prepare yourself. How do you prepare yourself? Fix yourself. Fix your midot. Fix your neshama. So what is, what is Shavuot all about? The whole holiday of Shavuot, the 49 days, is not about Matan Torah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, even bigger than Matan Torah was the preparation for the Torah. We have to prepare ourselves for the Torah. So every day, we count another day, day one, day two, day three. Why? As a constant reminder, we are one more day closer to getting the Torah. Did I do anything about it? Did I prepare even more? Did I learn more? Did I fix something? The whole holiday of Shavuot is not actually about Matan Torah, but rather about preparation of getting the Torah. And each one of us during the Omer is constantly reminded that today was supposed to be a day that you prepared to get yourself to the Torah and not just another day to play basketball. I have a follow-up question. Chavot. So, um, if it is connected, why don't we count 98 days? Why only 49? Because we, why 98? Started, because we started off at the 49th level of Tumah. Okay. And we ended off at the 49th level of Kedusha. Ah, yes, because it, it didn't work that way. It wasn't one day we got one, one day we got one. It didn't work out that way. The, uh, the Tuma got, we got rid of much faster. It was almost instant. But the Kedusha, we acquired one level at a time. So it didn't work like one day, one day. Next. The back, go ahead. Um, can God create a stone that he can't look over? This is a non-starter question. <laughs> Meaning that people ask this question, especially Israelis love to ask this question, because they want to know, wait a minute, if God is unlimited then can he create a stone that he cannot pick up? Because if he could create a stone that he can't pick up, then that means he's limited. And therefore he's not omnipotent, he's not everywhere, and so on and so forth. This is a non-starter question because it is distorting what God really is. First and foremost, God can do anything and everything that he can, but because he can do everything and anything that he can, he has to give rules to himself. He has to guide himself. He created the, the Torah. He created the world. He created you according to his own rules. And he's so great and so powerful that he cannot even restrain himself. So his inability, if you will, to create a stone that he can't pick up is not a limitation, but rather a show of his almightiness. Next question. Yes. So if God created the world and man in the first seven days, Okay. What, if, what about the primeval earth? What's the Torah's explanation to that? What do you mean? The earth, like, millions of years before there was any recorded presence of man. Who says there was millions of years? Scientific thought. Scientific theory. <laughs> now, if you look at a, uh, a person, a scientist by the name of... Um, uh, Gilbert uh, Godfrey, I believe it is. There's a movie you can watch called The Fingerprint the Fingerprint of God. It's a movie that was made about 30 years ago, and until this day, no scientist can reject it. In this movie, he's a scientist. He's not a rabbi. He's not a priest. He doesn't have any religious uh, agenda, but he's a scientist that actually proved that all of the dating methods, all of the dating methods that say that the world is a billion years old, two billion years old, a million years old, 60 billion years, whatever number you want to throw, or anybody wants to throw, because every scientist has a, has a different theory. No one has any facts. Theory does not mean fact. Theory means a theo theoretical guess, educated guess, if you will. They are putting certain facts together with certain likelihoods, certain possibilities together, and they're arriving at some type of thesis that this is a likely possibility. The problem is different scientists use different factors, different scientists use different methods, and therefore you'll have different scientists have different uh, numbers. One guy says the world is only 13.4 billion years old. 
The other one says, no, no, it's much younger. It's only 5 billion years old. Another one says 250 million. Another one says 700 million. And everybody has a different number. Now, if you really think about it, most of you guys are still teenagers or close to it. You're 20, let's say. Now, maybe a little older, don't take offense to it. I know young people take offense to being called young. But the point I'm trying to make is that just think about how much happened in your life over the last year. If you think about it for a second, lots of stuff happened in the last year. You went here, you went there, you went here, you went there. You did this, you did that. Lots of stuff happened in one year. Lots of stuff. 10 years, even more stuff. 20 years that you're alive, it's almost like your whole life. Now, it's a lot of time, right? So when you realize how much stuff happened in the world over the last 20 years, it's even more impressive. It's extraordinary. It's amazing. I mean, you realize that when you guys were babies, there was no such thing as iPhones. Like, from this generation, there's no such thing as, no such thing as iPhones. Because that's the way you, the world you, go, you grew up in. But really, 20 years ago, there was no iPhones. In fact, internet was still in its infancy. So just think about how much of a change has happened in the last 20 years. So to just throw around billions of years like it's worthless, oh, 250 million, 200, uh, 300 million, 3 billion, literally shows people that they don't know what they're talking about because they're just throwing away years just because as if it doesn't mean anything. Now, this same scientist showed that all of these methods are wrong. And the reason why is because all of them depend on specific factors to stay the same. Meaning, whether it's carbon dating, or using the uh, atomic method, or using all types of uh, uh, other uh, theories that they have, or studies that they have, every one of these things depends on certain things being static. For example, the temperature, the temperature of the atmosphere has to remain static for all of them. Now, why? Because if, let's say, for example, I have two eggs in front of you. Okay, I have two eggs. Imagine two eggs in my hands. And now I'm going to tell you which one is older than the other. Now, one of them looks black. The other one is white. You're going to tell me, of course, uh, the, the one that's uh, white is probably younger. The one that's uh, black is probably older. That's a logic. That's rational because what you can see is what you get. Problem is that you're wrong. Why? This one, this, this black one, I put it next to a uh, bonfire. I didn't put it inside the bonfire, I put it next to a bonfire. So little by little, the charcoal and the smoke and everything else affected it. So it looks older. The other one I put it in the fridge. So the conditions for both of these eggs were drastically different. So even though they both look drastically different as far as how old they are, in fact, they're the same, or perhaps even the black one is younger. Same concept when, it, when you rely on an atmosphere staying the same. They're all relying on the atmosphere staying the same and one thing that we do have a scientific fact about is that the atmosphere has not stayed the same. One scientific fact we do have is that the atmosphere has increased by at least one to three degrees. One to three degrees throughout the last, last several thousand years, which means that unless you can pinpoint exactly when it changed that one to three degrees, it is impossible for you to do any type of dating whatsoever because you are not comparing apples to apples and that's why many times when people have put these different types of dating methods to the test they actually try to make it fail why because to make it fail is really testing it not to make it pass when you don't have an agenda so what do they do they give them two types of bones and they said okay tell me the dating one they said oh this is 60 million years old and the other one says no this is uh, only uh, 50 million years old I said well this one is actually 30 uh, days old and this one is only 60 years old they're both monkeys so how come you thought they're 60 million years old? Because the dating system is depending on certain factors. And it's already expecting that whatever you bring it is assuming a lot of things that are literally theory and not fact. So point being is that even though scientists say that the world is very, very old, that doesn't mean it's right. We have to always remember that theory is not fact, but it also doesn't necessarily negate the Torah. Meaning that even if the world was 13.4 billion years old, nothing would change anyway. And the reason why is because our Torah doesn't start from, like Adam Rishon didn't start from 13 billion years ago. We start counting the 5779, 5779 years from the day he was born. So everything that happened beforehand is irrelevant. It doesn't change whether there's Shabbat or not. It doesn't change whether there's Kashrut or not. The laws of the Torah, the history of the Torah, and everything in the Torah doesn't change regardless of how old
the actual world is. And when you look into the Zohar, you'll also find that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did create six other worlds before this one. Six other worlds before this one. They're not the same as this one, but nonetheless, he did create other worlds before this one. So this world is not the only thing that ever existed, uh, but it is the last thing to exist because this is the last world. Next question. Yes. You have a follow-up? Oh, yeah. Yes. I was going to say, um, does that mean the Torah completely denounces evolution? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no, meaning we denounce the evolution like scientists have, where they say that everything came from one cell, and the cell went through mitosis or meiosis and split into two cells, and then into four cells, and then into eight cells, and eventually the cell became a little fishy, and then the fish became a uh, lizard with a nice little tail that was yellow, and then the uh, lizard uh, didn't like being a lizard anymore, so decided to become a little pig. And the pig decided that he doesn't want to be a pig, he wants to climb trees, so he decided to be a monkey. And the monkey decided, you know what, I want to give lectures for a living, so he became me. That didn't happen. We don't believe in that. What we believe in is that, yes, nature has changed. Nature has changed. So the the, uh, the uh, actual, even humans, human beings have changed to a certain extent, but not to the same extent as what science say. Science say that people came from nothing, uh, monkeys and apes and so on and so forth. We don't say that. We say that, yes, human nature has changed. We actually used to be much bigger people. Moshe Rabbeinu, for example, I told you guys last week, Moshe Rabbeinu was 20 feet tall. A huge, huge person in comparison to us. In comparison to us. But if in comparison to his generation, he wasn't the tallest guy. In fact, he was tiny little midget in comparison to Og. Og, the king of Bashan. So, nature has changed. Our ability, our strength has changed. The Gemara says, how do you know... What is what belongs to you in a field? What belongs to you in a field? That's you have a, um, a sheep and cows and things of that nature. How do you know what belongs to you? What belongs to somebody else? It says what belongs to you is as far as you can see. As far as you can see. So the Gemara asks, well, how far can you see? It says, well, the average person can see 10 miles. In today's world, there's not a single human being that can see 10 miles. At best, at best, at best, Maybe you can see a half a mile to a mile. At best, if you have some eagle vision. Average human being, a few hundred feet. A little bit further from that, it looks like an ant. You go up to, uh, let's say, the uh, Empire State Building. You go to the top. You look at everybody else downstairs. They all look like ants. You, can't, you don't know what's who. What's, you don't know if it's an ant or it's a human being. And that's only a few hundred feet. But in those days, a couple of thousand years ago, the average person was able to see, have a vision that was literally 10 miles. They could see clearly like I see you. So yes, nature has changed. There are certain animals that existed back then that no longer exist today. There are certain animals that even change slightly. But it's not to the same extent as what the uh, scientists or an atheist like to say. And by the way, the reason why they like to say this stuff is because if the world came from nothing, meaning that the world started with a cell, and no one is running in the world, then that means they don't have to listen to anybody. They can do whatever they want. So in essence, the whole argument just is uh, there to justify their behavior or misbehavior. That's against the Torah. Not, uh, it's, in essence, everybody loves the truth until it obligates them. Yes? You were talking about how they were 20 feet tall. Ken? So when did humans become, start becoming smaller? Shortly, I mean, there were smaller people even in his generation. The Levi tribe, the Gemara, uh, the Gemara says that the Levi tribe themselves were all 20 feet tall. And the reason why we know that is because the, the Mishkan, the Arona Kodesh, the Arona Kodesh that they would have to carry throughout the desert for 40 years, was also that height. So if they were short, they wouldn't be able to carry it because it would constantly drag on the floor. So at the very least, since the pole was in the middle, at the very least, they would have to be as tall as the Mishkan. So when they carry it, the Mishkan would be, let's say, half their uh, height. Because they're not carrying it like this. They're carrying it on their shoulders. Meaning that they had to be at least as tall as the Mishkan in order to carry it for it not to hit the floor. Some people were bigger, but some people were much smaller. For example, in the same generation, there was Pao. Pao was one and a half amot. Or one, uh, one ama. One ama is a little bit less than two feet. Paro was less than two feet, but he was a wizard and he was powerful because of black magic. 
So there was multiple sizes. It wasn't that everybody was 20 feet tall or 100 feet tall. It was that there was different sizes. Today, for the most part, everybody's relatively the same size unless you play in the NBA or NFL. Yes? Why did Hashem wipe out the dinosaurs? Why did he wipe out the dinosaurs? Well, he wiped out all of the uh, animals uh, uh, that lived at that time and only kept two of each because the animals, in essence, react to the actions of man. When man sin, it leads to the animals sinning, meaning the animals doing things that are against their own nature. A lion, originally when it was created, when it was originally created, was actually just like a cow. It would eat grass. It ate grass. That's actually what's going to happen when the uh, Mashiach comes. It's also going to go back to eating grass and straw and things of that nature. But what happened, because of all the sins that man made, they affected the animals, and the lion started eating meat. became a carnivore. On top of that, the sheep, the sheep that's usually a very pleasant, relatively, uh, you know, uh, peaceful animal became very vicious and started chasing the lion away. Wanted to eat the lion. And then the uh, other animals, like for example the zebra, didn't want to be a zebra anymore. It wanted to be a, you know, a donkey or it wanted to be a rooster. It want... So they started inbreeding between different species. So Kedosh Baruch destroyed all the animals because of that and only kept the ones that didn't sin. And those literally newborns. Now, aside from that, the uh, reason why he destroyed the, uh, the dinosaurs, or at least most of them, 99% of them, is because they, have, uh, they no longer had any use in the world. They lived their time. They had use in the world during that time because people were able to handle them, because people at that time were much, much bigger. There was a generation of giants and Nephilim at that time that were able to deal with the, uh, uh, with the dinosaurs. But uh, since Noah wasn't a giant and his family weren't giants and uh, Hashem only kept one giant alive just to show people what used to be, but there was not going to be a whole generation of giants. Therefore, there wasn't. It didn't make any more sense to Akados Baruch Hu to keep these animals in the world. Next question. Yes. Never. If he's if he is God, then he, there is no birth date. If he has a beginning, then that means that he has an end also. If God is limited to time, space, height, weight, anything physical then that means that he's just like you. So someone that's very old does not mean that they're uh, you know, unlimited. But when someone has no age, when someone has no body, when someone has no face, when someone has no likeness of a face, when someone has no limitations, no time or space, that means it's God. But once it's subject to time and space, then it's not God. Then it's just a creation of God. So God does not have a beginning or an end. If he did, then whoever was there before he had a beginning, that would be God. Like if God had a creator, then he wouldn't be God. He would be the son of the God. Space was created. Space was created when Hashem created everything. Originally, there was nothing. The Torah says originally there was nothing. There was just God. And God created space in order to create man. So originally, there was the only thing that, that existed was God. And then God, in essence, minimized himself in order to create space, in order to create mankind and create Am Yisrael and the Torah. Yes? What was the purpose of the dinosaurs? What was the purpose of the dinosaurs? Like many other creatures, they had a uh, purpose in that generation to uh, help uh, help mankind in one way or another, whether it be food or it be for, uh, for, for work. They could use them for farming, things of that nature. Uh, animals in general only exist to serve men. So anyone that, for example, is a vegetarian, or they call it a vegan today, because they feel bad, they call uh, they feel bad for animals. That's actually a, uh, a form of heresy. And the reason why is because Akados Baruch Hu said, you have to eat animals, you have to eat kosher animals during the holidays, during Shabbat. It's a symbol of happiness. But if you say, no, no, I don't want to eat a cow, I don't want to eat a sheep, because I feel bad for it. So what are you saying at that point? You're saying that you're more merciful than God. And saying that you're more merciful than God is a form of heresy. It's a form of kfilah. So, a Kadosh Baruch Hu created kosher animals in order for you to eat them. In order for you to use them. A Kadosh Baruch Hu created non-kosher animals in order for you to distinguish 
the kosher animals and also use the non-kosher animals. But there are certain non-kosher animals, like the pig, that you're not allowed to use. Like, for example, a pig, a Jew is not allowed to grow, not allowed to raise them. Even as a pet, like some people in Texas and other southern country, other southern uh, states like to uh, have these uh, pigs as uh, disgusting, but they like to use them as pets, but like it's a dog, you're not allowed to do that. But nonetheless, uh, other animals uh, that can be domesticated, you can't have, but uh, you can't eat them. The, the, uh, the other animals that uh, are, are kosher animals, pure animals, like a cow or a sheep or a deer, uh, or anything that has the hooves and uh, split hooves and chews its cud, that has those two signs, those animals you're supposed to eat. Uh, if uh, you don't eat them because you don't like the taste, that's one thing. But if you don't eat them because you have mercy, that's a form of kfirah, actually. It's actually heresy. Next question. Yes? Can I clarify on something you said before? Okay. You were saying that, what's it called, that there's going to come a time where, you, where man's going to have to choose either righteousness or wickedness, and they're really like, there's no room for middle, right? Yes. The middle. But, how, like... One person's like a hundred percent into Judaism could be another person's like fifty or like middle. It could be like you know. So is it like how? What's objective? A hundred percent. Objective is your full potential. So it says that, for example, that Shmuel was like Moshe and Aaron together. Obviously, it wasn't like Moshe and Aaron together because Moshe was Moshe, Aaron was Aaron. There were two Gedolei Adol, and Shmuel was also Gedolei Adol. But what does it mean? Moshe reached his full potential. The full potential of Moshe was not the full potential of Aaron. Uh, Aaron also reached his full potential. Shmuel also reached his full potential, but in essence, he did above and beyond as if in his generation, he was he filled his full potential to such an extent as if he's representing both of them. So the, the purpose of you, me, and everybody else here is not to become Moshe Rabbeinu. Even though the Rambam writes in Allah that every Jew can become Moshe Rabbeinu as far as righteousness, and every Jew should try to become as righteous as Moshe Rabbeinu, you're not judged as Moshe Rabbeinu, meaning, judge as Moshe, be as righteous as Moshe Rabbeinu, meaning reach your full potential. You, let's say, for example, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to reach, let's say, from zero to 100, zero being a sav, 100 being uh, the best, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, let's say, he reached 100. He reached 100. Now, we don't have the ability to be 100. We're not prophets, we're not this, but... Let's say we can reach 70. So your goal in the world is to reach 70. That's your goal. You, you, you can't get to 100. But you have to try your best to reach 70. So if you reach 60, it's good. It's just not your full potential. There's a missing 10, but it's not. But if you only reach 20, you only reach 25, then you have a very serious problem. Why? Because that means you didn't even try. But what if, what if somebody 70 is still bad? It's not good. Like That's someone was like a, a murderer. Right, if Moshe Rabbeinu only reached 70 instead of 100, he would have a very serious problem. No, but a regular person, like a, a, an evil person. An evil person, 70 is still bad, like objectively. You cannot be evil and go to heaven. So as far as not everybody goes to heaven. Uh, some people go to Gehenom, some people go to Gan Eden. The Gemara says that in Masechet Megillah, how big is Gan Eden, how big is Gehenom? So, Gemara says that Gan Eden, heaven, is 60 times the size of earth. 60 times the size of earth. So, so how big is Gainom? So, Gainom is maybe 60 times the size of heaven. But then the Chachamim said, no, that's not true. It's not 60 times the size of heaven. So, oh, so how big is it? It says it has no size. Why? It continues growing. Because so many more people go there than they go to heaven. So, evil people cannot go to heaven. You cannot be evil and go to heaven. You cannot be a thief and go to heaven. You cannot be someone that's evil and go to heaven. You could be a sinner that goes to heaven after you repent for those sins, either in this world or the next, but you cannot be evil. Now, when it comes to reaching your full potential, your job is to try to reach your full potential. Every person has a full potential. And Akadosh Baruch did not create a person to, with an inability to reach their full potential. Everybody has an ability to reach their full potential. Your full potential may be much higher than somebody else's. Somebody else may have a higher potential than you. Needless to say, you both have different targets. But both of you need to get to the max. If you get to the max, you have a fantastic eternal Olam If you don't get to the max, you'll have maybe a little bit of hiccup between you and Olam 
But if you don't even try, and you try to coast, and perhaps act like a goy, and perhaps look like a goy, and actually even be like a goy. And like, for example, one of the guys that I met yesterday, he went to yeshiva for 15 years, but he's been married to a goya for three and a half. He has a very serious problem if he dies tomorrow. If Mashiach arrives tomorrow, it's a very serious problem. Why? Because even though he went to yeshiva for 15 years, it didn't help him. Why? Because his desire for women was so strong that he forgot God. So he says, I believe in God, but I like this girl too. <laughs> so that's a serious problem. So now, if he does tshuva, gets rid of the girl, you know, says I'm sorry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Bezat Hashem finds a Jewish girl, Bezat Hashem raises a Jewish family, learns a lot more Torah to make sure that this sin never ever happens again, not for him or his descendants, then he can fix all of his mistakes in this world, and he can have eternity of good. If he does not, then he has a very, very serious problem, because if a person that's married to a Goya cannot, uh, cannot go to heaven in an uh, in a, uh, in a easy way, and if at all. So, point being is that he may have the same potential as you, more than you, less than you, it's irrelevant. You have to try to reach your max, he has to try to reach his max. You have certain, object, certain uh, uh, obstacles in front of you that you can handle. He has obstacles in front of him that he can handle. You probably can't handle his obstacle, and he probably can't handle your obstacles. But that's why you don't have his problems, and he doesn't have your problems. Whatever problems you have in your life, Hashem knows for sure, you can handle. Whatever problems he has in his life, Hashem knows for sure, he can handle. And so on and so forth. Each one of us has our own, our own, uh, our own uh, suitcase full of problems, and our own suitcase full of blessings. And each one of us can use those blessings to reach our full potential, or ruin everything. It depends which one, uh, which one a person chooses. Next question. In the back, front, Chabot. What's the purpose of having such a big uh, hell if, if it's just like a, a cleansing place, no? Like, That's what uh, rabbis in a generation of this uh, Sodom and Gomorrah we live in make you think that it's a cleansing place. But there's not a single source in the Torah that says that. Not a single one. I made a shiur. I speak about Gehenom here and there. I mention a fact. I try to get people's attention once in a while. But I actually, uh, because my uh, dedicated students asked me for a specific shiur about Gehenom for a couple of years, eventually I did one. And the reason why it took me a while to make it is because it's a very, very difficult subject because the uh, nature of Gehenom is incomprehensible to people. And the reason why is because we're limited with our thoughts, we're limited with our understandings, and we think that Hashem is limited also. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to the Prophet Isaiah, I don't think like you. I don't have limits like you. Meaning that we think that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is all-loving, and because He's all-loving, the punishment has to be limited. Meaning that... Because he loves us, because we're his children, because we are created in his image, because he wants the best for us, therefore, if we ever deserve a punishment, that punishment must be limited to maybe a year or a few months or something like that. There's no way that he will give us an eternal punishment. That's the mistake. The mistake is, is that we think he thinks like us. If we look at the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah, if we look at the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, if we look at the Masechet Shabbat, if we look at the book of Isaiah, the last verse, if we look at somewhere in a neighborhood of about maybe, I'd say, 150, maybe 160 sources that I mentioned in that shiur about Gehenom, in within the first five minutes, you realize that everything and anything you've ever heard about Gehenom is completely fake. What's the truth? The truth is, is that just like a Kadosh Baruch Hu has unlimited love, that even if you're wicked your whole life, he'll still welcome your tshuva if you do it because he has unlimited love he also has unlimited wrath meaning that if a person doesn't do tshuva the punishment is just as bad as the reward would have been the punishment is eternal just like the reward is eternal some people's punishment are obviously not eternal it depends what kind of sins you make for example if somebody steals they have a certain punishment but if somebody murders, they have a bigger punishment. But if somebody violates Shabbat, it's not even just a punishment. This is eternal punishment. 
Why? Because violating Shabbat on purpose, meaning not dying without doing tshuva for Shabbat, somebody driving on Shabbat their whole life, somebody working on Shabbat their whole life, somebody simply caring less about Shabbat, a person like that dies, or Mashiach arrives, that person goes to Genom and doesn't come out. Reason why is because the Kadosh Baruch Hu says, if you do not keep Shabbat, you in essence are saying, I don't believe in God. And if you don't believe in God, then I don't want to see you. I'm in Gan Eden. You're not going to say, I can't have, have you at the Gan Eden. So you have to go somewhere else. Where do you go? You go to Genom. Well, in Genom is uh, lots of fun. There's seven places. So point being is that the people that tell you that it's a cleansing place or they call it a washing machine or they call it a, uh, or there's uh, one, one heretic that calls himself a rabbi says that uh, really there's no such thing as Genom. It's just that your soul goes to a place, but it doesn't know how to be a soul. Your soul doesn't know how to be a soul, so it's confused for a month. It's confused for a month, but after a month, it learns what being a soul is. There's actually a rabbi that says this. And he, he puts this on the internet, too. He says it on a regular basis. If he, and he has thousands of followers. There's not a single source in the Torah that agrees with him. He just creates this out of his thin head. Now, when I spoke to his son, I said, why is your father lying? Why is your father lying? If, you don't, if you're not comfortable talking about Gainom, don't talk about it. Talk about Ganeddin. Talk about other things. But don't lie to people. You know what his response was? So what if he lies a little bit? This is what he said. So what if he lies a little bit? Look at the results. I said, what? The stock that you guys get? The buildings you're building? That's the results? We need Balet Shuvah. We need people to do Shuvah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, really? Oh. That, we need that. We need people to do Shuvah. So Rabotai, if you're going to live a certain lifestyle, if you're going to live, live a certain way, be a smart person. Make sure you verify all the things you believe in. Don't be one of these fools that has blind faith for no reason. If somebody tells you there's eternal Genom, find out for sure. Maybe he's wrong. If somebody says there's eternal Gan Eden, find out. Maybe he's wrong. If somebody says there's even a God, make sure there's, maybe he's wrong. Find out. Find out. Look, do some homework. Find out. You could ask questions. You could look at other lectures that we did. You could double check the books yourself. Find out for sure. Don't just believe somebody just because he has a long beard. Don't just believe somebody just because he calls himself a rabbi or because he wrote a few books. Don't believe him because they wrote books. There's a guy by the name of Shmuley Boteach. He calls himself a rabbi. Now, Shmuley Boteach was also so-called rabbi to uh, Michael Jackson, the pedophile. Now, Shmuley Boteach calls himself a rabbi, and he likes to call himself a rabbi. He calls himself America's rabbi. But what kind of rabbi writes a book with one of the most popular porno, porno stars in history? Pamela Anderson. He wrote a book with her. Now, he's not writing a book with Pamela Anderson about how she did tshuva and how she regrets the past. And, you know, if she could do tshuva, you could do tshuva, you know, to love her. No, what is he talking about? He's talk, He's having, he wrote a book about what? about sex so if anyone knows a little bit about how intimacy is such a holy and special subject in Judaism and how you're not allowed to desecrate and how you're not allowed to be promiscuous and how you're not allowed to waste seed and how you're not allowed to even be uh, immodest and so on and so forth understands that even being friends on Facebook with such a person is not allowed it's not allowed. Needless to say, write a book. Because when you write a book with such a person, in essence, what are you saying? Check mark to all of our work. She's good. In the name of Judaism. So, point being is, if anyone told you something, I recommend you say, do you have a source for that? Do you have a page number? Can I see? Can I see with my own eye? They may not remember it off the top of their head. Not everybody uh, has a good memory. But if they have, if they're worth their own salt, they're worth their weight in salt, well, they're going to know where to get it. So I don't have it now, but I'll get it to you by the end of the day. I'll get it to you by tomorrow. I'll get it to you by the end of the week. I'll get you the source. I forgot. I know somebody else that knows, but I'll get you the source. If they got you the source, and you see what they say in black and white, Ashrecha, you can go with it. But if they say, uh, no, uh, some rabbi said it. Okay, who's the rabbi? I don't remember. Everything they just said goes in the garbage pail. Delete box. Why? It's sourceless. Torah is very, very critical of people that say Divrei Torah without bringing the source. Without bringing a source. Even more so, saying Divrei Torah 
as if it's yours when it really belongs to somebody else. Like some other rabbi said it, but you're saying it as if it's your new insight. That's also stealing. You never died. Point being is that if someone's going to tell you something, and you're going to base your life on that, you're going to base your future on that, you're going to base your marriage on it, you're going to base your present on that, you have to make sure you have some legs to stand on. And that's what I told somebody yesterday, we were talking about the cash advance business. And uh, he told me that some rabbi told him that it's okay to be in it. I said, okay, well the rabbi made a mistake either because he uh, doesn't know the logistics of cash advance business, or uh, he simply doesn't understand business at all, or you misspoke, uh, or he uh, has a very big yetzer. I'm not sure, but either way, it's a mistake, one way or the other. But it doesn't make, it doesn't make the rabbi bad. It just makes it a mistake. So what I suggest, connect me with this rabbi, and I want to see what sources he used to say it's allowed, and I'll show him what sources it's not allowed. And then we can bring everything to any giant posek you want to bring it to. You bring it to the biggest poskim in the world. We go to Rav Mazuz. We go to the Rosh the Rishon Etzion. We go to Rabbi Tzach Yosef. We go to any big posek, someone that's reputable, not the local uh, uh, posek in the community. What a big posek! We bring them all the facts. If you have a single posek in the entire world that's reputable, say it's allowed. I'm going to make an entire lecture pitching you guys to go into the business, I'm telling you guys to go into it because it's allowed. So I said, if the rabbi wants to do it, no problem, I'll do it. But I can save you the time. You won't find anyone. You won't find a prospect to say it's okay. You won't find anyone with Yilat Shemayim to say it's okay. You won't find anyone that understands the business to say it's okay. Why? Because even the people in the business, every single one of them, even the Goim, know it's an unethical business. Everybody knows it's unethical. Nobody, no, there's no questions of whether it's unethical or not. The question is whether you like money or God. That's the question. Which one do you like more? If you like money more than God, then you'll have a lot of money from this business, but you won't have God. And if you don't have God, oh, then uh, eventually you'll find out what's, uh, what that means. Next, yes. You said earlier that God doesn't give you any challenges, he knows you can't complete. Yes. Uh, okay. So what would you say in regards to God giving challenges to some Jews that will ultimately like, end up like they can't feel like they can't complete and kill themselves? Uh, they so kill themselves better. because they gave up. They didn't kill themselves because they can't complete them. So, for example, suicide is a rich person's problem. And um, when the um, U.S. government did a research in 2000, I believe, 17, they uh, said that over 72% of the people that commit suicide are middle to upper class, meaning that suicide is a rich person's problem. Poor people generally don't commit suicide. Now, this defies logic. Why, you would think that the poor people should commit suicide because they have nothing to, to, uh, to look forward to. That's the, uh, the, that's the opposite of truth. And the reason why is because rich people get to a level of depression and hopelessness because they assume, they assume that their wealth will buy them happiness. Their cars will be happy. Their house will give them happiness. And once they acquire all the material they have, all the material they want, and they realize they're still depressed, they're still gonna get a divorce, their kids still hate them, they're still addicted to drugs, and still pretty much they have the same or even worse problems than anybody else they know, they become much more hopeless faster than the poor person. And the reason why is because the poor person still has hope that all of his problems could potentially be solved if he had more money. If he had more money. Now, that rich person or poor person that committed suicide did not commit suicide because he had a problem that he couldn't deal with he committed suicide because he got to his own conclusion wrong conclusion nonetheless but wrong conclusion that his current status is permanent meaning that his current misery whether it's a broken heart or a broken bank account or a broken uh, company or a broken marriage or perhaps even a loss in a family like somebody died he believes that his current state of mind, his current sadness, his current situation is never going to change. And anyone that lives long enough will tell you that it does change eventually. It does change eventually. Time does change. So even if somebody lost a son or a daughter, chas shalom, or perhaps somebody lost their company, lost their money, there's plenty of people that have recovered if they continued. For example, during the... Uh, 2008 crash of the market there was one German billionaire that lost 90% of his wealth 
He was already in his uh, late 60s. He was worth $9 billion in 2006. By uh, 2008, he lost over 90% of his money. He was only worth over uh, a few hundred million dollars. He decided that life is not worth living with just a few hundred million dollars. It's not worth living. So he committed suicide. He ran. He went into a uh, train track and let the train hit him. Now his son, his son, who inherited all of his problems, inherited all the debt that he had, all the companies that failed, the few hundred million dollars that, you know, not so much money. Guess what? Between 2008 and 2018, he grew those few hundred million dollars to even more money than his father had. Because the situation that his father saw wasn't actually as bad as his father thought. It wasn't permanent. Some of the assets recovered. Some of the companies recovered. Some of the things weren't as bad as they looked at that time. And that's the problem with people that get depressed. They assume that their current depression is permanent. And that's the problem when somebody does not have emunah and bitachon and Hashem. When you believe that you're the one that controls your own destiny, it's very, very simple to become hopeless. It's very simple to justify suicide. But when you realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that's running the world, and He's the one that can save you from everything, He's the one that can heal you from everything, He's the one that does everything, meaning that if you have a pain on your side, if you have a pain in your heart, if you have a pain in your bank account, if you have a pain anywhere, He's the one that's doing it, and He's also the one that can heal it. If you understand this single point, you'll never get depressed, and you'll always has, have hope for the future, regardless of how many problems you have. But if you don't realize this point, and you think that you are in control of your own destiny, and your own bank account, and your own success, then it becomes very, very easy to become depressed and suicidal, simply because you realize that you cannot fix it. And you're right, you can't fix it. But you're wrong because you think that you're the one that's obligated to fix it. Hashem is the one that's uh, going to fix it. You just have to believe in Him. Follow up? Yeah, so following that up, you considering that like God knows everything for like past, future, and present, since He knows that like some, some students may kill themselves given the task that He gives them, why does He still do it? Because it's still their choice to kill themselves. Even though HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows the future, to him there's no such thing as future. The HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees the past, present, and future as a single vision. Meaning the minute he created the world, the world ended. But for us to understand what that I just said is impossible because we think everything in the context of time. We measure everything according to time and space. He doesn't have, he's not subject to time and space. He created it. If he didn't create time and space, he would be subject to it. Once he creates it, that means he's above it. So now, since HaKadosh Baruch Hu, past, present, and future, is all the same to him, he knows how the world's going to end. He knows what was in the beginning. He was at all point. But nonetheless, that does not change our free choice. What is it like? If, let's say, for example, I told you I know the future, and you say, nah, no way. I like your beer, but no way. You don't know the future. So I say, okay, I'm going to show you. I can prove to you that I know the future. How can I prove it to you? I'm going to write everything on a piece of paper. I'm going to put it in an envelope, and I'm going to give it to you. So you show, you know I'm not manipulating it. You carry that envelope, but don't look at it. The whole day. In fact, the whole week. Might as well, if I know the future. The whole week, you carry that envelope, but don't look inside. You go about your business. We say bye. We'll meet next week. Same day, same time. You come back the next week. We say, okay, guys. Audience. Clap. Cheers, let's open the envelope, see what happens. We open the envelope, we see in the paper, everything that you did that whole week, I wrote down already. Did that change your free choice? No. So even though I knew it, nothing changed for you. That's in essence, a little bit of an understanding of how God's knowledge works. He knows the free choice, but it doesn't, he doesn't influence your free choice. So that's why the Gemara says, Akol shamayim chutz shamayim. Everything is from heaven except fear of heaven. Whether you were born or die is from Hashem. Whether you're male or female is from Hashem. Even though some people want to be girls, even though they're boys, and boys want to be girls, and girls want to be boys, in reality, the boy will always be a boy, and the girl will always be a girl, regardless of what name they choose and what dress they decide to wear. Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides whether you live or die. He decides whether you're tall or short. He decides whether you're beautiful or ugly. He decides whether you're rich or poor. He decides everything except 
whether you will follow what he says. That's your choice. Everything that you do in accordance to your relationship with him, that's up to you. So what does that mean? You know that there's rules. You know that you are, as a Jew, obligated to eat kosher food. Non-Jews don't have to eat uh, kosher food, but they're not allowed to eat animals that are still alive. If the animal is still alive, don't chop off its leg and start eating it, because that violates the seven Noah Hyde laws. At least kill the animal, and then you can eat whatever you want. But Jews cannot eat whatever they want. They can only eat kosher animals, animals that are called pure, that have two signs for, uh, for uh, the cattle, which is... Uh, chew their cud and split hooves, and if it's fish, they have to have fins and scales. If they only have one of those signs, they're not kosher. So you now know this. You know this, and you decide that, you know what, I know that I'm supposed to eat kosher animals, but uh, I don't feel like it. I like McDonald's. Now I like McDonald's, I like a cheeseburger from McDonald's. And you decide to do it. So even though Hashem does not want you to do it, you still have a choice to do it. He's not going to interfere with your choice to do it. You can still do it. If you do it, you'll have to pay for that choice. If you don't do it, you'll get rewarded for making that choice. Point being is that even though he knows that you can make both choices, he doesn't interfere with those choices. So that's in essence a little bit of a uh, understanding of how free choice works, but at the same token, how that coincides with Hashem's knowledge of the future. Yes? With what you were saying about fish and scales, like fins and stuff, What's, let's say we genetically engineer like a form of shark or something to have scales. Would that be considered a kosher shark? Well, sharks, it's not a shark if it has scales. Well, with science, genetic engineering, you can make certain animals have certain things. Like some fish we can make them glow in the dark, you know, like science is reaching through a whole bunch of different places. Yeah, I know about a little bit about science. And yeah, they're interesting reaching uh, certain things. But uh, if they create a fish, they're not really creating. They're improvising. They're, uh, yeah, they're, they're, machine, they're, they're changing the nature yeah. of something that already exists. For example, they created, a, or some people say that they found a way to uh, genetically engineer a pig. Uh, genetically engineer a pig, and since this pig does not come from a real pig, it comes from a seed of a pig. But nonetheless, it's genetically engineered. So somebody says, oh, this should be kosher. And it was even a rabbi that they found in some garbage pail that says, oh, yeah, this, uh, this, this, this pig is kosher because it's not a real pig. It's a pig that was genetically engineered. And all the rabbis, uh, that are real rabbis, uh, said, why don't you just stay in the garbage pail and stop with your nonsense. So, yes, there are certain things that can change. There are certain things that can change, that cannot change. But for everything to change, it always has to have the G'dolei Ado with you, all of the specific issues, because there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all when it comes to halacha. We have to review each specific, okay, each specific case, see why, who, what, when, if it should be allowed, even if it is technically allowed, should we still allow it? Because there are certain things, for example, that technically, according to the Torah, are allowed. But the rabbi said that it's still not allowed. Why? Because we know that if this would be allowed, it would look bad. It would look bad and would look like something else is allowed, allowed. So, for example... You're not allowed to eat blood. As a Jew, you're not allowed to eat blood. But that's, the Torah says, you're not allowed to eat blood of animals. A fish, you are. You want to drink the blood of a fish as a nice uh, little juice? Enjoy. Yeah, some people like it. It's their, their taste. Not for me. I don't even like the fish itself. Yeah, but some people yeah. like the actual uh, blood of a fish. You're actually allowed to drink the blood of a fish like you drink orange juice if you want. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to do that, you have to make sure that the skeleton of the fish is right next to you. Why? If anybody comes and sees your cup of blood, he's not going to be able to determine whether this cup of blood is a cow or it's a fish. So for him, you say, oh, wow, this guy's a rasha. He's a rabbi of a kila and he's drinking blood of a cow. I'm going to tell everyone, put him on YouTube. I'm going to put him on uh, Facebook. That this guy's wicked. So that means that you also have to be worried about what other people see. What other people see. What other people will interpret. So there's certain things that are allowed, certain things that are not allowed, not necessarily because they're in the Torah, but also because the rabbis were commanded by God himself, the several psukim in the Torah, that talk about how Kadosh Baruch Hu asked the sages to put a fence around the fence, meaning you know your generation, you know your generation's weaknesses, you know your generation's strengths, make sure that they have a fence around my fence. Why? If they violate... 
my rule, that's deep trouble. That's deep trouble. If they violate your rule, it's not good, but it's not like violating my rule. So what do you do as a rabbi, as the sages? What was the job of the sages? Put a fence around the fence, meaning make sure that you know enough about your generation that you keep them away from ever even coming close to violating my, uh, my uh, uh, mitzvot. So for example, that's why they created Mukte. Mukte is not from the Torah, it's from the rabbis. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you're not allowed to write. You're not allowed to write. So the rabbi says, yeah, well, before he writes, he has to pick up a pen. And if he picks up a pen, most likely he's going to write. So what are we going to do? Let's put a fence around the fence. Let's protect him from himself. To already give him in his mind, don't even touch the pen. If you touch the pen, it's a sin. It's not as grave of a sin as writing, but nonetheless, it is a sin. Why? Because you're violating that fence of the sages. So the sages' job is to know their generation and know their limitations and know their weaknesses. That's the jo- that was the job of the sages, and nothing has changed. So, for example, regardless of what science will come up with, whether it be genetical engineering of specific animals or perhaps uh, different types of uh, foods, and th- you know everything has to be reviewed by poskim and has to go through a uh, alakha, alakhic, uh, uh discourse, different opinions, and then they will make a determination. And that's actually all of the alakhic books that you see today that keep coming out. It's not new laws. It's not new laws. Everything that we do is based off of the Torah, and then you have the oral Torah, which is the Gemara, and then you have the Shuchan Aruch and the Ramah. So all of the laws, everybody agrees with the same laws. No, it's not like different laws. So what are these, all of these new, you know, Allahic books? It's how to apply these old laws to new stuff. When Rabbi Yosef Karo 500 years ago put together Shuchan Aruch, there was no such thing as cars. So you can't make a law on something that doesn't exist at the time. Once cars came into the world, then the poskim of that generation say, okay, so how do we apply this original law from the Torah, from the Gemara, from the Shulchan Aruch, to the car that exists today in the early 1900s? How do we apply it? Is it fire or is it not fire? Some people say, wait, I don't know. I don't really see a fire coming out, so maybe it's not fire. Well, I have a student that's an actual engineer, and he actually did a study, and he sent it to me, and he said, the fire... It's not a single fire. It's actually thousands of fires, but it all depends on how many how many miles per hour you're driving. On the average, if you drove, let's say 60 miles per hour, 60 miles per hour, you have lit thousands and thousands of fires just by drive, just getting to that speed limit. If you drove 50, 15 minutes, let's say from your house to some really far away shul 15 minutes, you probably lit somewhere in the neighborhood of close to a million fires. And for each one of them, it's a new sin. So the people that drive to Beknesset on Shabbat thinking that they're doing a mitzvah, little do they know, they violated Shabbat a million times just on the way there, another million times on the way back, and Hashem Echem, how many more sins by people seeing them do it. So that's why it's important to know what is the halacha, what can we do, what can't we do, who can we rely on, who can't we rely on, and don't just take people's word for it. Look for it for yourself in a book. Just like if you want to learn how to invest, you read a book. You want to learn how to be uh, successful, you read a book. You want to learn a certain trade, you read a book. Everything you read and you learn. Same concept. Learn about your own life, your own future from a book. We have, Baruch Hashem, millions of books in Judaism that Baruch Hashem will give you every single answer you can imagine. Yes? Since there is no unbroken chain of smicha from the beginning, okay. what is a rabbi like nowadays? So the Gemara in Masech Bav Metziah, page 32a, this has a, a, a debate between three Rabbanim, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yudan, Rabbi Yossi. So he says, who's your Rabbi? So Rabbi Yudan says, who's your Rabbi? Your Rabbi is the one that taught you Divrei Chokhmah. What's Divrei Chokhmah? The one that teaches you Zmarah. That's your Rabbi. Rabbi Yossi says, no, it's not Divrei Chokhmah. It's the one, meaning Divrei Chokhmah, meaning the things of wisdom. Things of wisdom, the Gemara says, what's things of wisdom? The one that taught you Gemara. So then Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yossi says, no, no, it's not the one that taught you Gemara, but rather the one that taught you Torah. What does it mean, Torah? You have, let's say, 100% knowledge. Whatever your knowledge is, it's 100% of your knowledge, right? Now, you didn't learn 100% of your knowledge, most likely from one rabbi. You usually learned it from, let's say, two, three, four, five rabbis. 
whoever taught you the most out of those three, four, five rabbis. So if let's say you have uh, five rabbis, 40% you learned from four of them, and 60% you learned from your main guy, your main rabbi. That main one, that's your rabbi, Rabbi Yossi says. But then Rabbi Meir Balanez says, no, 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 we learned from David Melech. Who's your rabbi? Anyone that taught you even a single halacha. And from there we learn anyone that teaches real Torah, Real Torah, not uh, Smurfs Torah. Real Torah, according to what Chachamim say, according to what Kadosh Baruch Hu says, he's considered a rabbi. The smicha, as far as getting a certificate, is only something that's relative re- recent invention. It's a recent invention in order to give significance to leaders, in order to make the communities respect rabbis, but also in order to make sure that the people that call themselves rabbis have some basic form of knowledge and not just calling themselves rabbis because they want a job. So they did create a smicha that, uh, you know, in America you have certain types of tests that you have to take in order to get a smicha. In in Israel, it's a completely different type of way of of acquiring a smicha. Needless to say, there is a smicha process, but as far as a real smicha, as far as to be a rabbi, according to the Torah, it's a uh, Moshe Rabbeinu gave it to Yeshua Benun, that doesn't exist anymore. The other form of smicha is simply if you teach Torah. That's what the Gemara says is the smicha that will always exist. Anyone that teaches Torah is considered a rabbi. As far as having a certificate on the wall or something that, uh, you know, let's say it says that you have a certain basis of knowledge, that exists also, but that's not from the Torah. That's more of something that's become more of part of our tradition over the last few hundred years, which is a good thing to have simply because it, uh, uh, it helps understand who and what and where uh, this person, uh, what kind of knowledge he has, especially in today's world where you have a lot of people that don't know anything, but yet they have uh, a bit knesset. And some people, uh, you know, have a certificate, but they don't actually use it. So it's important to know that who you're dealing with. I'd say that we still have to go to the Gemara, which is to go and figure out what is he actually saying. Is what he's saying according to the Torah or is his opinion? If it's his opinion, the smi- whether he has a smicha or not is irrelevant. If all he talks about is his opinion, it doesn't make a difference whether he has a smicha or not. Why? He's pretending to be Moshe Rabbeinu. But if he's telling you what the Torah says, then it also doesn't matter if he has a smicha. Why? Because all he's doing is repeating what the Torah says. What does the Torah says? He's telling you what Rashi says. He's telling you what Rambam says. He's telling you what Moshe Rabbeinu says. Then it's actually irrelevant what he says. Why, do I, why would I like for him to have smicha or not if I need a specific skill? That that smicha verifies that he has. For example, if he's a shochet, I am not going to have just anybody slaughter my animals. I want someone that's an expert, that's biki, an expert in slaughtering. So I want to know that he got training to be, a, a, you know, to do butcher, to do like, slaughter the animals in a kosher way. Not if he just tell me, no, no, I, I did it a few times. No, I want to know that he did. How do I know? If he has a smicha that says I have an expertise in this trait, or if he's doing chupai and kiddushin. The Chupai Kiddushin, people think it's simple. Anybody that does a few blessings, they can do it. Big mistake. Big mistake. To be to do Chupai Kiddushin, you have to be an expert about the halachot of Chupai Kiddushin. One time, I had a student who told me that uh, he's getting married. I said, Mazal Tov. And then he told me bad news. What did he tell me? He told me that a certain rabbi was going to do his wedding. And I asked him, well, is this rabbi uh, Biki? And, uh, is he an expert in Chupai Kiddushin? He goes, well, well he did... Uh, Many weddings. I said, I didn't ask you if he did weddings. I asked you, is he an expert? Is he an expert in doing weddings? He said, well, I already spoke about it a few times, and he said, oh, he could do it, and he did other weddings. I said, I didn't ask you that. Again, is he an expert? Does he have a smicha that he's an expert, a certification, he's an expert in doing chupai and kiddushin? He said, I don't know if he's an expert. I don't know if he has a smicha. I said, okay, so let's start. Let me ask you a few questions. Did he ask you about your divorce? He says, no, he doesn't have a divorce plan. I said, okay, you're not allowed to use him. Why? That's the first question you have to ask a person. Why? If you are st- never going to get, you're not allowed to get married. If he didn't ask you whether you're divorced or not, and you already know this guy for three, four years, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Why? He's going to read you from a Sidu. You can get a Palestinian to read you from a Sidu. You don't need to be a rabbi for that. No, you need to know whether you're allowed to marry these two people. 
Did he ask you about your wife being a convert? Did he ask you about your wife whether she's divorced? Did he ask you all these different things? No, this guy's annoying. He knows how to read from a Sidu. I'll get your Palestinian from, from Hamas to, to, to read for a Sidu. They have to be an expert. Why? Because if he marries you and you're not allowed to be married, you have a very, very serious problem on your hands. She, if she, for example, never got a get, you're with her, it's Eshet Ish, no Olam Abba. So people need to know that there are certain things you need to have a smicha for. There are certain things you don't need to have a smicha for. Needless to say, if somebody has it, it's not a bad thing. It's definitely a plus. If they don't have it, it doesn't necessarily cancel them out either. Uh, it all depends on what are they doing. If they're teaching Torah, smicha doesn't necessarily uh, matter that much. But if they're doing a specific trade, then you need to know that they have the smicha to actually perform that trade. Next. Yes. Eel, yeah, no uh, scales, so, no fins either, I think, right? So I've seen, though, correct me if I'm wrong, I've seen uh, somebody, you know, kosher at a restaurant, eel eggs and make an eel sauce, is that? No, it's a, uh, a lot of the stuff that you see in restaurants, for example, you see uh, um, uh, lobster uh, or eel, it's not real lobster, it's soy, it's soy-based products, it's not, uh, it's not real eel, they just put it flavoring that they believe is the flavor of that, and some of them actually know that's the flavor because they perhaps maybe they ate it if they didn't eat kosher one time. But nonetheless, it's soy based. It's not a. Uh, so it's it's not a real eel. It's not a real lobster. It's, it's just a it's soy product. Eel, eggs. Um, even that. Even that could be uh, soy based. It could be a day. today with technology that they have, they can make humans from soy. <laughs> they can make anything from soy. It's a uh, fantastic product, uh, but. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, as far as eggs, you know, for example, fish eggs have to come from a kosher fish. You can't eat, let's say, uh, eggs from non-kosher fish. Because Torah says, Ayotzemi tame tame. Something that's impure only produces impure. So you cannot eat something uh, from something that's impure. So if the, product, if the animal itself is impure, there's no way that you'll be able to eat anything that comes from it. Shemot or the beginning of Ayuk, I believe it says uh, that when you even see your enemy full of wandering, you're obligated to return it to him. Okay. Now, if you're obligated to do that, when a Jewish person uh, sees or something of the sort, like a goy or a secular person getting attacked um, or in danger, can you as a Jewish person call the police or help that person in that situation? Or do you ignore the situation? If you see another Jew get attacked, can you call the police? No, not another Jew. So if you see another person get attacked, can you call the police? Yeah. You're obligated to. Okay. Yeah, you're not allowed to. Uh, if let's say if you see, that's what the pasuk is saying. If you see that your, uh, you know, just another person has uh, their donkey fell in the uh, hole, you're not allowed to just ignore it and pretend like the donkey because it's not your donkey. It's okay. You can just walk by. Uh, you have to care about humanity, not just Jews. So if you, uh, if you see your friend suffering, or if you see your fellow suffering, fellow human being suffering, you have to do whatever you can to help them, if you can, if it's within your power. If it's not within your power, it's not within your power. You're not obligated to sacrifice your life for them. Like, for example, if you say, see that a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, members of the mafia are, uh, or some gang are uh, shooting up some guy, you're not obligated to go and uh, fight them, because that's going to put your life at risk. In fact, uh, you know, it's a, you shouldn't put your life at risk. But if you choose to be, it could be a praiseworthy act, not, you know, depending on who, what, when, and how. Uh, but as far as to help somebody simply by making a phone call or taking them to the hospital, things like that, that is definitely an obligation. That is definitely an obligation. If it's within your ability to do it, you should definitely do it. Anything else? Yes? How would you describe God's infinite mercy? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the most humble of all because all day we violate his laws and he still gives us more time so for example if you and me were good friends and one day I decide to just slap you in the face you may like me and say you know what I don't like that you slapped me but I'll forgive you and if I slapped you again five minutes later say, hey stop it I like you I don't want to fight you but if I slapped you the third time most likely you're gonna give me a beating that I'm not gonna forget why you don't like being slapped HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't only get slapped. 
We spit on him. We step on him. We curse him. People say they don't believe in him. People ask questions about where did he come from. People ask different ty type of things or think different type of things that are literally anti-God. They start organizations against God. They have entire web websites against God. And he sits there quietly, mercifully, saying, I'm going to give you more time to chuba. I'm going to give you more time to fix yourself. I know that you have evil inclination. I know that you have peer pressure. This guy influenced you. That guy influenced you. All types of things influence you to do certain things, and that's the reason why you're doing it. So I'm going to give you more time to turn around and come back to me. I'm going to help you out a little bit. Sometimes I'm going to give you hardship that you're going to realize that your friends can't help you. So I'm going to give you that hardship in order for you to realize that you need me. Not that you should believe in me, that you actually need me. And he waits for certain people more than they deserve, quite frankly, all of us, more than we deserve. But that mercy, it has a limit per se, according to his own rules, which is he gave himself a rule that he's not allowed to put a wicked person in the same place as a righteous person after they leave this world. Meaning even though the wicked person was funny and nice, and he gave charity, but if he was wicked according to the Torah, and he violated Shabbat, and he wasted seed, and he was married to a Goya, and so on and so forth, even though a lot of people like him, it doesn't matter to Hashem. What matters is, what, how did you, how was our relationship? So if a person finishes their life that way, once they get up to Shemaim, there's no more mercy. There's no mercy. At that point, there's judgment. Here there's mercy. The mercy is that I'll give you more and more time. I'll give you more and more opportunities to turn things around. If you turn things around, I'll welcome you with open arms as if nothing ever happened. Which is something that a human being can't, a human being can't do. Why? If you look at, for example, marriage. If a woman, a normal woman, loves her husband, she is going to care a lot about him. But if one day, after they're married for, it doesn't matter, one day or 50 years, she finds out he cheated on her, relationship is over. Why? I know it's not a matter of just the physicality. It's a matter that his heart that he dedicated to me, he gave it to somebody else, I want nothing to do with him. Now if he says I'm sorry, you can say I'm sorry until you're blue in the face. Even if I forgive you, it's only partial forgiveness. Why? Because I still know you did it. And I still know that, you know what? You're not 100% with me. So the relationship, even if she's willing to take him back, which is not normal, but nonetheless it happens, the relationship can still never ever be the same and most likely it's just a matter of time before it breaks anyway. Why? Because she knows he's a cheater. He's not honest. So she's never going to trust him again. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is different. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I know you cheated on me your whole life. 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you cheated on me. You went to Buddha, you went to Jesus, you went to Islam, you went to pork, you went to, uh, you know, uh, beef lo mein from the Chinese menu. You went to all types of things that I said no. But then one day you got a chidus from some guy that came from New York to Florida and he gave you some insight. You're, Psh, wow, I want to I wanna believe in Hashem. I love Hashem. What do I do? And all of a sudden you start changing your whole life. I love Hashem. I love Hashem. I love Hashem. I'm going to do everything he says. And Hashem says, I love you too. As if nothing ever happened. All the past, let it be past. But that's assuming you did real tshuva. Not uh, you did it today and you're back to being a shah next week. You did real tshuva, you repented, you're sorry for it, you're not going to do it again, and so on and so forth. So that's also another aspect of the unlimited mercy that Hashem has, which is something that a human being simply can't do. Can't do, because we have emotions that are subject to our, you know, our own mentality, our own limitations. And even when we say that we forgive somebody, most of the time, we don't forgive 100%. Let's call it that. Most of the time, there's a part of us that I still hate him a little bit. I still hate him. I, I, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. But in my heart, I hate you. But I forgive you. I love you. You give a hug. You give the hug. Hug. But in reality, you look at me the wrong way. Why? Because that's us. That's us. That's the way we are. We have a nature that, okay, I'll forgive you, but I'm always going to watch out for you to see if you can do it again. Which means what? I don't 100% forgive you. Even Yosef HaTzadik, Yosef HaTzadik, Torah says, Yosef HaTzadik, when did he die? At what age? 110 years old. Why did he die at 110 years old? He lost, all of his brothers died at 120. He died at 110. Why? 
Gemara says because he didn't forgive his brothers 100%. He lost 10 years because he didn't forgive his brothers 100%. Even though he said, I forgive you, even though he gave them power and strength and he said, I love you and everything is good, in his heart, which HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows, he didn't forgive them 100%. So for that, he lost 10 years. If Yosef HaTzadik couldn't forgive 100%, needless to say, it's very hard for us to get, forgive 100%, especially for big things. I'm not talking about if somebody is late to an appointment. You know, you didn't forgive them. If you didn't forgive them for that, then there's something wrong with you. You're supposed to forgive people. I'm talking about for big things. Somebody really, uh, really did you wrong. You're supposed to forgive people 100%, but in general, it is very, very difficult. You have to be on a very high level of, of uh, Kedusha in order to be able to forgive people 100%. What level of Kedusha is that? You have to be as humble as you can possibly be. Meaning that you have to put yourself in a situation where somebody spits on you and say, wow, it's raining? Wow, I can't believe it's raining. That's the type of person you have to have. And everybody here can do it. Everybody else can do it. Meaning you're creating an excuses for his crime. Justifying his crime. Why? Because you don't want to be angry at him. This work requires work. It requires work on your character. And if you do that, you'll succeed. And if you're merciful on other people, then they'll be merciful on you and Shemayim. If you're not merciful on other people, then obviously, needless to say, it's they won't be merciful on you and Shemayim. So ideally, we should forgive 100%. Naturally, it's impossible for us, which means that the only way that we can get to that point is by working on our character traits, our midot, and Vezot uh, Hashem, our Torah. Anything else? Yes. Um, you spoke about the subject about what happens in Tachon and Hashem. Okay. And people that trust in him. Yes. But where do you find the balance of putting in your own effort and trusting in our team? So the Chachamim say how much Bitachon you should have and how much effort should you have. And the uh, answer is you should have as much effort based on how much Bitachon you should have. Meaning, the debate between in the Gemara Masechet Brachot, page 35b, it says there's a debate between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. How much Torah you should learn versus how much work you should make, how much work you should uh, perform in order to make a living. And the Gemara says that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, uh, all different types of psukim that uh, tell you that uh, you should learn Torah non-stop. You should never stop learning Torah and don't bother working. Don't even bother working. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu will provide. If you're learning as Torah, of course HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to provide. Why you should you even bother working? Rabbi Ishmael says, no, no, no. You have to work. You have to work a little bit. You have to learn a little bit. As it says in the uh, book of uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verse 14, Ve'asafta de'ganecha, meaning that you will gather your grain, meaning that HaKadosh Baruch Hu already gave you mitzvot, saying... Go work. It's okay to work. So what's the what's what's the uh, what's the real debate here? How much should you work? So the conclusion is as follows. Rabbi Shmuel says, I'm not saying that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Tana Kadosh, is wrong. What I'm saying is that not everybody can withstand the test that Rabbi Shimon and his students can test. Why? Because in order for you to learn 24 hours a day, meaning in order for you to only learn without working for some company, without making a living in a traditional way, you have to have 100% bitachon in Hashem. You have to have 100% confidence in Hashem, and Hashem says, if you have really 100% confidence in me, the money will arrive at your door. Where do we learn this from? From the man. From the man. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave all of Am Yisrael man from Shemaim. But not everybody got the man at their doorstep. Some people got it at their doorstep. Some people had to walk four, five, six miles to get it. Why? It was based on your bitachon. If you were righteous, if you had a high level bitachon, if you knew that a Kadosh Baruch was going to provide for you, the man arrived right at your doorstep. If you had a little bit of a doubt, maybe I should get two today instead of one. Maybe I should get a second job. Maybe I should like do this. Maybe I should do that. Maybe I, if you had some lackings, the more lackings, the further the man was. So now, Rabbi Shimon, he's not telling you don't work. He's saying, have a lot of bitachon. If you have a lot of bitachon, you don't have to work. Why? Because the man will arrive at your house. Whatever you need will arrive. 
to such an extent that Rabbi Yisrael Misamag, even motarot, even things that are extras, even fancy stuff. If you have a high level of bitachon, you can even get fancy stuff. You could be even rich. It's not just for like, oh, you're going to eat, um, you know, a uh, little uh, three-day-old bread with cheese. No. If you have a high level of bitachon, you can even become a multimillionaire without working a single day in your life traditionally, if you have bitachon. If you don't, then you have to work. How much should you work? Depends on how much bitachon you have. And that's what Rabbi Shemayin is trying to say. Rabbi Shemayin is saying, yes, if you like Rabbi Shimon, you have 100% bitachon. Only study, don't waste a single minute working. But if you like most people, you have bitachon, but not 100%. You have, I don't know, 60%. You have 50%. You have 70%. You have, you know, you're not, uh, you have. So he says, okay, so work. Work, how much should you work? Depends. If you have 70%, then you can work a uh, part-time job. You work four or five hours, study the rest of the day. If you have a little less bitachon, you have, let's say, 50% bitachon, then you work a regular job nine to five. Work a job nine to five. If you have no bitachon, then I don't know why you even leave your house because how do you have bitachon to even survive the day? If you have a lot of bitachon, you can do anything. If you don't have any bitachon, you should be scared to leave your house. Meaning that every person has to have some level of bitachon and if they don't, they have to work on it. But the point being is that you should work as much as you have bitachon. Now, people have a uh, problem with this simply because they believe that a Kadosh Baruch Hu, if you trust him, then at the best, all he will provide for you is your basic needs. Meaning, you'll eat bread, you'll be like one of these like half a homeless people. You know, like your house will have like holes in it, there's cockroaches everywhere. You know, you're eating the same bread for three weeks. The kids don't even have pants that fit them, but you're alive. You're alive, but you know, you're not, you don't, you're not like the guy that people invite to their house. You're like the guy that people say, oh, stay away from him, he's homeless. Even though you have a house. No, that's what people think. People think that a Kadosh Baruch Hu only provides like homeless panasa. If you have a high level of bitachon, a Kadosh Baruch Hu could literally make you a multi-billionaire without working a single day in your life. Without a lot of ticket. But he can do it. And he's done it. We've seen several examples of it. One of the examples is Moshe Rabbeinu. Another example is Rabbi Akiva. So we've seen many times in the Torah that the righteous became very, very wealthy. For example, uh, Rav Ovadia. Rav Ovadia, at, uh, in his beginning of his uh, marriage, they were barely able to afford a house where the entire house was a single room, not a one bedroom. It was a single room, meaning the kitchen, the bedroom, the, everything was in one room. It was simply like, a, like what we call a closet. That's where they lived. That was his house. They didn't have any money. Somebody came to visit him to learn Torah. And they, they sat on a table together, big table. They're learning, learning, learning. After about an hour and a half, the guy that, that visited the rabbi starts hearing a baby cry. And he's looking. He's like, yeah, the whole house is tiny. So he sees, where's the crying coming from? And he finds out it's his wife and a couple of kids that are under the table, letting them study. So her, the, the rabbinit, the rabbinit, didn't have a problem with it, but her sisters had a problem with it. She said, why'd you marry this guy? What are you going to do, eat his books? Why'd you marry this guy? You crazy? Well, as you would have it, Ravadja, Allah Shalom, got an award for, uh, from the, actually from the, from the country itself for writing one of his uh, books. Little by little went up in Torah, became the Rishon Tzion, became the Gedol Ado, and Baruch Hashem, uh, you know, lived a life full of wealth of every aspect. He cared less about wealth, but nonetheless, he never lacked a single meal. He had lots. I mean, his, uh, just his house, I think, is worth maybe $10, 15000000 million. So it's not like a, uh, if you are, have bitachon in Hashem, you're going to be homeless. Hashem will give you exactly what he, what he wants to give you. If you believe in Hashem 100%, and you believe that Hashem can give you an infinite amount of money, He can give it to you. If you don't, then you already lost before you started. So the point being is that we have to constantly learn about this specific subject of bitachon in order to increase our bitachon. And you have to give yourself tests in order to see where you stand. For example, Asab Slabotka used to give himself different targilim, they call it, different tests. So he would say, I have bitachon and Hashem that he's going to allow me to study Torah in the middle of the woods without 
me needing to bring any fire. So he went into the woods. He had a cabin in the middle of the woods. He didn't tell anybody that he's going there. But he told everybody the story after, and they had the uh, proof of it. He said, I'm going to go learn to lie in this cabin in the middle of the woods. No one knows he's going. Now, in the afternoon, he's learning. In the uh, late afternoon, he's learning. But then it started getting darker. Well, his test was that he knew that a Kadosh Baruch Hu will provide light no matter what. As the second it got dark, where he wasn't able to see the words on his book, he opened the door. He saw somebody over there holding a candle, a lit candle. He took the candle and he continued learning for the rest of the night. What was the proof of it? He kept the candle for two decades. Two decades that candle was there showing everybody how he learned. It was lit for many years. Like the candle never went out. It was one of those miracles. So why? He had to be the Honda, because those will provide. He didn't ask how will Hashem provide? When will Hashem provide? Who will Hashem provide? He didn't ask those types of questions. Why? Because he had 100% beat the home that Hashem will provide. How? That's his business. When? It's his business. Why? That's his business. All I need to do is believe that he's going to provide. Apoteach be Hashem, chesed Yisur bevenu. David HaMelech says, if you have confidence in Hashem, kindness will surround you. If you have a high level of kind, a high level of beat the Hashem, all you'll have is constant miracles around you. So the Gaomi Vina says, and we'll finalize with this, but Gaomi Vina says, why does it say, Apotech Hashem Chesed Yisrovenu, that someone has confidence in Hashem, kindness will surround them. Why does it say, a confident, righteous person will have kindness? So the Gaomi Vina says, e, this means, even if the guy is a Rasha, but he has Bitechon in Hashem, Hashem will even help him. Why? Because having Bitechon Hashem is so significant that even if he's wicked, but he has confidence that Hashem will help him to rob the bank, to go steal, to go do wrong things, Hashem will actually help him do it. That's how valuable Bitechon Hashem is to it in Hashem's eyes. Because Hashem will have some more shiurim next week. Uh, we have uh, Sunday night. We're back here. Baruch Hashem, we, uh, we learned a little bit about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, his Torah, Kadosh Baruch Hu's Torah, Baruch Hashem. And I think, uh, you know, hopefully next week we have some new questions. On Sunday, we have a, um, the, uh, what is it, Bitachon series, actually. Bitachon series on Sunday. Tuesday, we'll be back in, uh, so Sunday is here. Tuesday, we will be in uh, Aventura. And Wednesday, we're back here again. Uh, for anybody that wants to contribute to the, um, the uh, Feeding the Poor Kids in Eretz Yisrael, uh, there's a special... Uh, uh, account that we started for it, a campaign that we started for it, that anyone that wants to contribute to it. We're trying to feed at least as many families as we helped in uh, Pesach. In Pesach, we're able to help about 400 families. Uh, so, so far right now, we have about 100. Enough for 100. So we're trying to get a little bit more. Anybody that wants to contribute, please do. Obviously, Kiruv is not just uh, learning Torah, but it's also not just feeding the poor. And of course, also anyone that wants to contribute to this program that we have, this amazing program to help young people come to the Shulim, can also contribute to that. We'll make a separate campaign for that. Uh, and needless to say, anyone that wants to have a mitzvah should take the shiur, share it with their friends, share it with their family, without thinking twice, because every single person that watches this can learn something from it. Amen ve'amen. Bye-bye. Yes, hi. How are you? Baruch Hashem, what's doing? I, um, I want to be able to see the source for? for altering your state of mind. Altering your state of mind as what far book? as what? Oh, you mean, you mean the, yeah. uh, the question I asked. You mean uh, the marijuana stuff? Yes. I have a shiur about it. I have a shiur about it. Text me and I'll give it to you. I'll give no, you the whole shiur. You sent me the shiur. I, I, I sent you the shiur? Yeah, you sent it. You sent no. it. But it's an hour and 30 minutes, you know. I started watching it a little oh, bit. Oh, well, you want to be but... spiritually lazy with me? That's no, I, I, I just want to see where it says in the book. Is that okay? It's just no problem, but uh, there's more than one source. There's more than one source. You look at the... Um, it's not a... Uh, you know, the Torah doesn't work that way, where there's yes and no and we're finished. Mm -hmm. There is a... Uh, how they got there and so on and so forth. So, for example, if you remember, there is a... Uh, in the Torah, there's something called a Ben Sorer Moreh. Okay. Ben Sorer Moreh is a wayward child mm -hmm. that uh, disobeyed his family, disobeyed his, uh, his parents, 
is belligerent, drunk, and so on and so forth. So if he does not fix himself, then uh, they take him to the bed the bed kills him. So what so, if it's not disobeying your parents? What if your parents... No, no, no. This is, I'm talking don't. about the Ben away. Okay. Hold on. Why is he being? Because he's a, they say he's a drunk, he's an alcoholic, he's a, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, all types of bad things. So somebody like that, it's better to kill them than to let them live. So Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Rav Shalom, says that someone that distorts their um, state of mind has the dean of a Ben Sorel Umore. Yeah, this is all the uh, different sources. So, okay. Yeah, this is it. So here you have Masech Psachim, page one one thirteen a. Then you have. Because it's right next to Asidu. Oh, thank you. Then you have uh, the Rambam in Chod Deot Alachan number twenty. Then you have Masech Psachim one thirteen a. Then you have uh, Rabbi Shavtai Sefer Share Dea. Then you have uh, over here of uh, Yaakov Kamenetsky talks about it. Then you have a. Uh, Ramoshe Feinstein, as I told you, this is a Gott Moshe, Chelek Yore Dea, Chelek Gimel, Siman Lamed Bet. He calls it a uh, Ben Soro Moreh. Then you have Book of Deuteronomy, Sefer Dvarim, chapter 21, verse 18. That's the Ben Soro Moreh, that's the original source. Uh, then you have the Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Aruch, Choshen Mishpat, Siman Tavchav, Seif Lamed Alef. Then you have Yore, uh, Yore Dea, Ilchot, uh, this is a... Uh, also another uh, Then you have a uh, I'm sorry, the Shukhan Aruch. Then you have uh, this this is the Siman. Uh, this also talks about cigarettes. Then you have uh Rashi and Masekhat Sanadrim, page sixty eight B and also seventy two A. And I uh, obviously have all these other ones. Uh, then you have uh, over here. Um Oh, Piskedin Rabbanim of Yerushalayim. They put a specific din about it. Stifle um, Gaon uh, talks about it. So, Baruch Hashem, that shiur is not, uh, it's it's source after source. It's probably, I think I mentioned, well, probably I mean, someone I'm, in the name I'm going to get down to watching. Yeah, but, uh, I mentioned many, many sources. Um, and um, it's a, uh, it's not something you say lightly because people uh, take you know people people don't like to hear this stuff, but that's why we have a lot of sources, Baruch Hashem, mm-hmm. and uh, not just if it was one source, one thing, one verse, one thing, you'd be a lot more careful with saying such a thing. But uh, but when you have uh, all across the Torah uh-huh. talking about it, so so let me ask you, so a mentor or more is someone that like a son that disobeys their parents, okay. right? Let's say it's the case where by doing, by, like let's say smoking marijuana, you're not disobeying your parents because let's say your parents don't mind or don't care, or they say it's fine. Right. So would no, that be, still be considered a... No, no, the ben soil right? more meaning, it's not, meaning, it's not saying that the, uh, um, someone who smokes marijuana is a ben soil more. saying he has the same dean as him, same de- meaning the same judgment as him, death penalty. Meaning if the Sanhedrin was here, the original son of was here, and somebody smoked marijuana, they'd kill him. You get a death penalty. It's not that he's, this is the same thing. It's two different sins. Because one guy's altering his mind, you know, and the other guy is uh, being wayward. He's, he's, he's disobeying. But because he's disobeying, he has a certain judgment. Because he's altering mind, he's disobeying Hashem. Not, uh, not his parents. It's irrelevant to his parents. In essence, he's disobeying. He's being wayward to his parents. He's being wayward to Kadosh Baruch Hu. Meaning the deen is the same thing. It's not the same sin, but the judgment is the same. Uh, so that's what Rabbi Moshe Feinstein said. Other other rabbanim look at it in a different way. They look at it in simply that you're not allowed to alter your state of mind because you, are, as a Jew, I believe uh, it's one of the uh, commentaries on the Ten Commandments itself. As a Jew, you're supposed to constantly be in a state of mind where you are in front of Hashem, as if you're in front of Hashem. Now, if Donald Trump came here, or some uh, I don't know, some leader that's respectable came here. You wouldn't be high normally. You would most likely be at your best. You wouldn't. Uh, uh, Talking about personally. Normal people, people that uh, people that are. Because uh, <laughs> I, I would care. You may not care, yeah, because you're still young. Once you get a little older, you'll start caring. 
if your life was on a line, you are about to meet a judge that is going to determine whether you live or, or die. Yeah. The last thing yeah. you're going to do is smoke marijuana before yeah. or be drunk. I'm not going to meet, meet uh, Donald Trump to have a coffee with him. I'm talking about somebody that has a position of power that can determine life or death. You're not going to smoke marijuana before him. You're not going to smoke, you know, take a few shots before. What are you going to do? You're going to be your best. You're going to be all of a sudden, you have a tie on, three piece suit, all of you fix your hair. Everything is fixed. Why? You're going to look like you're a perfect human being. Needless, if you're going to do it in flesh and blood, needless to say, you have to do it to Hashem. And you're always in front of Hashem. Therefore, it's not enough. So it's a. Uh, so. Um, but it's allowed when it's needed for medical reasons. If somebody has uh, chronic pain, somebody has chronic pain, and traditional medicine does not work for them, and this works better for them, then they're allowed. But even for that, they're not allowed. You know, they, because recent uh, technology has allowed the uh, the THC, I believe, to be removed and a CBD to give that. If, you know, the, the uses the medical part, then you use that. Oh, right. uh, you know, so you don't need to get high anyway. You can use the drug, but without getting high. Right. That's a hundred percent kosher. Okay. Um, so I actually asked uh, a different rabbi because I I felt like it's better to get multiple opinions rather than just. This is not my opinion. It's all the sources I told. Right. Yeah. Um. So he told me that it's okay as long as it doesn't get to the point. Where it would affect any learning Torah or doing mitzvot, it would affect your ability to do learning Torah or doing mitzvot. What's the source? No, I don't know. Zero. You have, you can make copies of it if you want, okay. or you could take the shiur. Can I take pictures? Yeah, you can take pictures. You can take the shiur. The shiur is all the all these sources are mentioned in the shiur. Mm -hmm. You can watch the shiur. Show me one, one. I have, I don't know, many sources. I don't know how many sources there is, mm -hmm. but a few pages worth of sources. Small handwriting. Few pages worth. If he gives me one source that says he's right, I'll make a whole shoe about how you're supposed to smoke, smoke marijuana. Okay. It doesn't exist. You can look, enjoy it. it. Doesn't exist. The only leniency is if you're sick. To do it for recreationally, there's not a single person that would say it's allowed. To say as long as it doesn't interfere with the learning Torah, but he probably smokes marijuana. He probably smokes marijuana. That's what he says. That's how he makes his own leniency. Yeah, I don't think he does. <laughs> I doubt he does, but you never know. Somebody, like, people no. tell people a lot of things because they feel that the public is weak. So they tell them what, you know, okay, if I tell him, yeah, what do you want to hear? Because they say, listen, if I tell him that he shouldn't smoke, then, you know, he's not going to listen to me. And then he won't come to me for maybe something that's a bigger problem. Like maybe he wants to marry Goya. So let me just tell him, okay, smoke, but not that much. And hopefully I'll get him, you know, I'll, I'll connect to him stronger and stronger over time that hopefully I'll influence him to stop at some point. This is flawed logic. But that's the logic that people use. Same thing, for example, the guy I met yesterday. He says that his rabbi in New York told him that uh, cash advance is allowed as long as you only deal with goyim. The problem is that that's completely false. Number two, you cannot know if you're dealing with only with goyim. We don't have such distinct names anymore that you know for sure that this guy is Jewish or this guy is not Jewish. There's plenty of John Cohen's in the world that you cannot know if he's Jewish or not. And you're not allowed to ask him in business or in, in this country. But the rabbi, you know, told him, yeah, you could do it as long as this. Because he figured that if he tells him you can't do it, you won't listen to him anyway. That's, that's not how Allah works. I have to tell you what it says. Whether you do it or not, it's your business. I have to tell you yes or no. I tell you, tell you what a Kadosh Baruch Hu said. You want to do it? Do it. You don't want to do it? Don't do it. But at least I, I told you. When people start taking, you know, stuff into account, it always leads to failure because you're pretending to know what's in your mind. I'm pretending, you know, the, the guy that's telling you, oh, whatever you want to hear, he's assuming he knows what you can handle. Like, he's assuming you can't handle the truth, so therefore, he's not telling you the truth. That's not fair. What if you can handle the truth? If he simply told you, yes, you're not allowed, there's at least a 50% chance you just say, okay, I'm not allowed. That's it. Finished. I, I can't do it. Or you can say, I, you know what? I can't do it. I'm going to continue. But at least I know that I have to try to stop at some point. Mm -hmm. But now that you have two opinions, you're more confused than you started. <laughs> Why? Because he's a rabbi and uh, you know some people call me a rabbi and uh, I have a bunch of sources. But you don't really know if he has a source. But you're assuming he has a source. You're hoping he has a source. Mm -hmm. No, but he so now, care. the next time you're going to go to him and you ask him, show me the source, and he doesn't provide it to you, guess what? That relationship 
it's completely well, destroyed. He said he hasn't learned any sources that go against it. He says he yeah. find any sources that show it to him. That's what he said before oh, yeah. he finished, yeah. Just take a picture and just send it to him. Oh, yeah, Moshe Where's... Feinstein. There you go. Go right here. This is the main That's one. The... He's, he's, he's probably Ashkenazi, right? Yeah. Okay. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. That's the one he's going to care about. The rest of it he's not going to care about. That's enough. That's it. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says something, it's like, and if uh, for Ashkenazim, it's like God said it. Might as well be. Mm. No, 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 that's that's what it is. Enough. Once he sees that, finished. Finished. Okay. So, uh, but again, always, always ask for sources. It's uh, it's sad that we have such weak generation of rabbis that we people assume a lot of things. That was my big problem. That's why I uh, I speak against it all the time because I had rabbis come to my office a few times a week for years, fifteen years. Not a single one of them ever told me to do tshuva, keep Shabbat, nothing. So. If they would have told me, at some point in 15 years, there's at least a 50% chance I would have saved myself a lot of agony and pain. You know, maybe I wouldn't have listened, but there's a 50% chance I would have listened. You know, so that's the thing. So that's why I always tell people, listen, anybody can call themselves a rabbi. Who cares whether they're rabbi or not rabbi? I could be a dog right now. If I have a source, that's all that matters. You know, if, if you know Bilam, is, you remember the story of Bilam, Barashat Balak. He got rebuked by who? By a donkey. The donkey Hashem opened, you know, by Yiftach Hashem at Pia Aton. Kadosh Baruch Hu opened the mouth of the, uh, of the donkey. The donkey started talking to him and rebuking him. And we learned from that. What? Even if the truth comes from a donkey, you still have to listen to it. Why? Because it's irrelevant what the source is. As long as it's true. But once somebody says, oh, you know what? I don't know. I don't know uh, anyone that says it's not allowed. So therefore, I should assume that it is allowed. That means his ideology is wrong. He's supposed to assume the opposite. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to assume it's not allowed. Because he doesn't know if it's allowed, he's supposed to assume it's not allowed. Why? Because there's case. a million and a half reasons of why it shouldn't be allowed. Right. Until recently, it wasn't even legal. You know, so even, so obviously there has to be a reason for it. So I don't know what kind of rabbi he is, but he, maybe he's a little old, maybe he's not, I don't know what he is, but I would, uh, I would question Hmm. Uh, he told me from his standpoint. His standpoint, he's never seen anything that goes against it. That's that's pretty much what he said. So he hasn't learned. So now, yeah, I'll show him the picture. Uh, I could get, but you can show him the shoe also. There's many yeah. other many other stories. You can take pictures of all of them. I'm just saying that say uh, the, the whole shoe, the whole shoe mentions all of these uh, sources and everything else, and it's a. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I I mean, it talks about addiction, drug addiction already. 1500 years ago and this is Masech Pesachim the first thing that I started the lecture with so um, I don't know I don't know God bless these rabbis I don't know what to tell you it's really sad for me to, 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 to hear this it's just I don't know I don't know I mean honestly I think I think I, yesterday I met a kid went to Yeshiva 15 years he met, he's with a Goya for 3 years I said you know what he was better off just going to public school save the money if he's still going to be with a Goya at the end anyway what's the point I asked the kid some questions he doesn't know a single thing in Torah I said, I don't understand. So what you learn in school? He goes, oh, we learn how to be robots. We learn how to just, uh, you know, pray. I said, okay, you know Hebrew? He goes, no. He says, how do you pray? He goes, I read. I said, so, so what do you read? He goes, I read Hebrew. He goes, you, you don't understand anything? He goes, I don't understand a single word that I'm reading. So what did you do for 15 years in yeshiva? He said, I don't know. So that's the thing. We have a, we have a, I know, we have a troubled generation, both of rabbis and of people, but that's what we're doing, what we're doing. You know, so little by little, you see the light, you'll see this, you'll see other things. And you'll start realizing, okay, you know what? Certain things I can do. Certain things are hard for me to do, but nonetheless, either way, I know the truth. I know what I need to do. Certain things you can stop right away. Certain things are gonna take you a little time, but either way, you'll know the truth constantly. Mm -hmm. And that way, you'll at least know which path to go. School meets what about? So the show, I see you guys uh, Sunday. Sunday yeah. What's your name? Menachem. Menachem. Okay. So. Oh, okay. So, so you said you're going to talk about Bitochon on Sunday? Can't visit the show. So I learned something uh, on Tuesday. It was about Bitochon. I'm going to bring it with me. Right, right. Perfect. 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 Shechem. Call to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody? Josh was good. I spoke to uh, Uven. I spoke to Uven. And uh, I had a nice conversation with him. He's a nice guy. But I told him it's, it's, he's too connected to his son. I said, why, why are you going to put yourself in that situation? I, I'm sorry, I told him, you're not my student, but I'll, I'm talking to you like you are. You love your kid. It's connected to you. Four years. You will go visit him every day. Now you're going to move to Florida. How are you going to go visit him? So you're going to go once a month? How long is that going to last? 
then you, let's, let's say maybe you have a kid. Then what? If at some point you're going to have to pick, and then that's going to lead to a problem. So why get into that? You just get somebody local. No, you know, you're not. Uh, there's no relationship yet. There's a friendship. There's no relationship yet. So just go somewhere. He understood it. He gave it to the point. No, he had no friendship either. I'm saying is that best. There's a friendship. There's just like there's no like the love here. Like oh, there's just like a, yeah, it's an idea. Nice guy. Nice guy. Yeah, that was the best. Yeah, that was the best. That was the only way I was going to have a conversation like that because on the phone it would just take too long. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, he seems like a nice guy. Seems like he has good intentions. It's just that. I think he's so desperate to just start something new that he does, he's not thinking of all of the things that will come from it. And if he goes into a relationship like this, it'll be a divorce within a couple of years. Or it'll be a miserable relationship because he'll constantly resent the wife that's you know, separating him from his son. Who wants to be a married to such a thing? We already have enough problems. Skinny's about Rosh Hashanah Sunday. So Rosh we're getting a lot of people. So Shem is answering our prayers. Rosh Hashanah. Rosh how are you doing? Ken, Ken, you're back. It's good to see you. Ken, it's good to see. How's your sons? Huh? Yeah, okay. He's uh, still work with the bank. He works at the bank, right? Yeah, was working. Works at the bank. But uh, the, he left and then he became a, a he became a barber. Okay. I don't like that story. Yeah, you, you went to school for it. I remember. You went to school yeah. to be a barber. Yeah, yeah. But I, I thought he would do well in. Uh, I could have private school and then you said you become a barber. Okay, and then he said yeah, good, good.